the Health and Sport Committee in 2018. Can I ask everyone here please to please ensure that mobile phones are off or on silent uh, and while it's possible to use uh, devices for use of social media, I'd ask you not to film or record the proceedings. Uh, we have people who do that for us and uh, all of that is uh, readily available. Uh, we have apologies from one member of the committee today, Miles Briggs. Uh, can we move quickly to agenda item number one, which is subordinate legislation, uh, a, 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 an instrument in relation to superannuation scheme, the National Health Service superannuation scheme, Scotland miscellaneous amendments number two regulations of 2017, which we considered uh, last week and came to the view uh, that we would seek clarification from the Scottish Government because uh, of uh, points raised with us by the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee regarding the drafting of uh, that regulation. Uh, our response has been received from the Scottish Government. Uh, the advice from the Government is that there is no detrimental effect on any members of the superannuation scheme uh, and that they will correct the amendments, they will correct the error in the regulation as soon as possible, uh, but it is a drafting error rather than one that has a substantive effect. On that basis, I would recommend to members that we make no recommendations in relation to this instrument and uh, allow it to proceed. Thank you very much. That's, a, that's appreciated. And now we come to uh, uh, item number two on our agenda, which is in relation to the preventive agenda uh, and uh, an opportunity briefly for members of the committee who have visited local drug support services over recent weeks uh, to put their uh, uh, comments on the record before we open the wider roundtable discussion. So if I can start, please, uh, with Ashton. Thank you, Convener. Uh, I've uh, visited Turning Point Scotland um, in Edinburgh, and I met a group who used uh, the service there, and we sat and had a conversation for a, about, I think it was over an hour. And there were a, a number of issues that came through quite strongly, so I'll just um, outline what those were. They felt that um, users were definitely being parked on methadone um, and they felt that everyone should actually be on a reduction plan to try to try to get them off, but they felt that wasn't the norm, in their opinion. Um, they felt that GPs weren't always able to signpost effectively to what services and support might be available um, to them. They felt that NPS should be added to the strategy. They said they thought it was more addictive than heroin and that users were very unpredictable and they thought it was really a growing problem that should be looked at. And they also um, drew out for me that they felt there was a strong link between mental health issues and the likelihood to start using drugs. And they felt that possible intervention at that early stage could be very preventative. Thank you very much. Uh, Jenny Gilruth. Convener, um, I visited the Drug and Alcohol Partnership in uh, Kirkcaldy yesterday actually and met with service users for about an hour as well. Um, the main issues that were highlighted to me uh, were, first of all, in terms of homelessness. So people becoming homeless and then applying for rehousing. Uh, Fife and the rurality that that brings in in terms of people being moved around, um, causing great stress because people were moved to faraway locations from where their family might have been and where their doctor might have been. So issues around about getting their medication then as a result. Um, there was also a result, I, I suppose, then in terms of their script not following them. So if, for example, they were hospitalised as a result of a taking... Uh, an overdose, for example, their script might not follow them into the hospital and then there would be a, a lengthy wait in terms of for that to kick in again. Um, there were waiting times uh, highlighted as well with regard to referral, so having to be referred from the doctor, uh, the length of time it, it took to get a doctor's appointment initially and then to get that referral from the doctor uh, onto the drug and alcohol partnership or, and then onto a more local service within Fife itself, uh, which can take months as far as I'm led to believe from yesterday's evidence. Um, and again, as Ash alluded to, the stigma associated with drug use more generally. Um, and I suppose the sense of shame and embarrassment that causes some people in local communities where people might know each other as well. Thank you very much. Emma Harper. Thank you very much, Convener. Um, I visited uh, the Alcohol and Drug Pre Prevention Facility at Lochfield Road in Dumfries and met with service users. Um, stigma and the rura rurality of our area was one of the big issues because everybody knows your business and also the rurality of travel. So it was suggested that bus passes are given to people as in their treatment uh, while they're in treatment and that would help facilitate attendance to appointments and, uh, and engagement. Shared care between GP practices was um, 
listed as a problem because some GP practices just don't engage. Um, also, the, there was interest and support for decriminalisation following Portuguese or Canadian models. Um, also was highlighted was from staff members that I spoke to later, a central electronic database for digital prescribing, no paper, traceability, meaning that it would be easier to follow up and improve governance with uh, the prescribing. Issues were raised also with prisons and the fact that when um, service users were at the end of their sentences, they didn't have a GP, they couldn't register for a GP, they were seen as homeless, and so there's challenges there. And uh, other issues related were um, further challenges of opiate dependence, gabapentin in the next five to 10 years. We need to think about the services that we are going to have to provide to prepare to meet the need for the knock-on effect uh, for the workload as that progresses. Thank you very much. Alison Johnson. Um, thank you, Convener. Miles Briggs and I visited the Spittle Street Centre in Edinburgh and met with a, a group of young people who, who were trying very, very hard um, in recovery. And I, I think what came across from our visit was the support they felt they got in the practice was absolutely invaluable. They said being able to attend there every day, to meet with peers, some of who had gone on to you know, to, to, to obtain a degree, for example, gave them real inspiration. They felt that it was possible, but they were absolutely determined that attending the centre was much more helpful than visiting a GP, getting a prescription. They said the fact that they had to get up and have somewhere to go every day made a huge difference, started to introduce an element of structure to their lives, which sort of lessened gradually. They might be expected to attend every day, then a couple of times a week, then weekly, um, as, as they managed to you know, to improve. So I think that positive role model, the peer support that was there, extremely important. They spoke too about the difficulties of finding that service, that pathways need to be much, much clearer. It has to be more easily accessible. Um, the service too works with groups who are out on the street in Edinburgh, often finding and working with homeless people and bringing them towards the centre. So I think that was a really important part of it too. But they were absolutely determined that that we need more of the services that they're able to access there. Thank you very much. Ivan McKee. Uh, thank you, Convener. I, I visited the Glasgow North East Recovery Hub and a number of the, the issues that came up there were very similar to what we've heard. There was certainly an issue, a concern around about people being parked on methadone for very long periods of time. Um, there was an issue around about there's been a change in the way that the services have been delivered and there was some concern about that from what they'd called the, the, the community day services previously into a new model. And um, there was a lot of comment around about there wasn't enough. Previously, they'd had six to eight months to go through a programme, whereas now it was much, much shorter, only a few weeks. There was lack of peer support. They're having to go to different places for the services. Um, and very importantly, they said that the, the, the previous service had been abstinence-based and it wasn't now. And they felt that that was, was a, a significant issue. Also comments around about prison. There was examples of people going into prison clean and coming out as addicts, which was uh, which was concerning. Um, and um, also a comment about people who are moving through the recovery journey and then going to college courses, but possibly having low esteem and some people have experienced that and finding it difficult to settle into a mainstream college uh, course and was there something that could be done to support that in some way? Thank you very much. Brian Whittle. Uh, thank you, Convener. Uh, I visited the Ad Action in Kilmarnock and, and a lot of the, the themes that have already been mentioned uh, were reflected in, in their evidence um, around being parked on methadone. Um, for example, we had a, 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 a lady who had been on methadone for 20 years before she actually realised that you could get off methadone. Um, didn't even realise that was a possibility, and that was only by chance meeting with a peer who, uh, as, 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 as Alison Johnson had said, had, had herself um, uh, come off of methadone. I think one of the things that, uh, that came, came across really strongly was that, uh, uh, the, the effect of living life on methadone. Um, and that, that there was no feelings and no dignity and that, that, that the feeling of life slips away and that every day was kind of like Groundhog Day and that methadone is part of a part of a solution and in itself not a solution. Uh, we also heard that um, uh, there was no rehab or detox available uh, in uh, East Ayrshire uh, and there was a lack of resource. Uh, GPs don't know where to refer and how to refer and that mental health teams, uh, as has already been said, is uh, should be part 
of, of the solution. And finally, one of the things I thought was uh, quite pertinent was there's no map of servicing uh, of services and opportunities available to um, uh, 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 those people who are in themselves living a chaotic life and perhaps not best placed to be able to access these services. Thank you very much. Sandra White. Uh, thank you very much, convener, and uh, I want to thank the people that I met in the North West CAT uh, and uh, ADP there as well. They were very honest, they were users and also people who had been users who were actually working there, and I was set four questions to ask. Uh, the first one was about the psychoactive subsidies, which are not included in the strategy. Um, they feel as though they should be included in the strategy. There was one young boy who actually, uh, through using these illegal you know, highs, and some people call them legal highs, had become addicted and had been in and out of prison. So they felt that absolutely it should be recognised more and it should be within the strategy. Uh, the next question that I was asked uh, was what evaluations had been done. Uh, the group had said sometimes they felt that you could over-evaluate too much and there is no outcome. So they, they thought that maybe uh, in a strategy it should be six months and then they should know what the actual evaluation is, and there should be a follow-up. After that, they felt they didn't get enough information, but they were uh, evaluated too much and didn't know what the outcome was. Methadone programme is one that I was asked also, absolutely the same as others. Uh, people have been part of methadone for 23, <coughs> 25 years. Uh, they said that any other drug, such as heroin or anything else, you would get like a six weeks detox or six months detox. You would not be there for 20 odd years. Uh, that really has to be put in place. People are on it absolutely far too long. The next question I was to ask was the current strategy, was it effective? Uh, they mentioned that in some instances it was effective, it could be for individuals, uh, basically, but they didn't cover uh, older drug users, 45 and over. They need to look at that again at the strategy. They wanted to, a more holistic uh, policy put in place, such as employment, training, uh, staff should be trained in addiction, that people come in to see them, job centres, that type of thing, and they felt education, training and employment was part of it also. And one area which came up very, very strongly, we had one lady there and basically said that uh, women uh, were treated differently uh, from men. There were not enough services for women uh, drug users, and I noticed that in some of the policy documents I was reading also, and uh, they were less likely to be able to get into rehab, and there was no women and children's uh, rehab centres, and they wanted to look at that as well. And mentioned the Portugal uh, model too, was raised with me uh, a couple of times as well. Thank you very much, and thank you very much to all my colleagues. That's been very helpful in setting the scene for a wider discussion. I should also note that my predecessor as convener of the committee, Neil Findlay, I visited West Lothian Drug and Alcohol Services in Livingston and will uh, provide us with a written report of that visit so that we can publish that as well, which we will do uh, on our website uh, in order to uh, provide a complete picture of the visits that were made. Uh, we now move on to a roundtable discussion of the very same issues around substance abuse and uh, the roundtable format for anyone who's not uh, taken part uh, before is uh, informal in the sense that uh, it's not a, a panel discussion, but again, be helpful uh, if comments could come through the chair, either questions uh, or responses, and, and I will, of course, try to call everybody. But to get us underway, uh, I will uh, ask everyone to introduce themselves very briefly. Uh, for those that I haven't met, I'm Lewis MacDonald, I'm Convener of the Committee and MSP for North East Scotland. Good morning, I'm Ash Denham, I'm uh, the MSP for Edinburgh Eastern and I'm the Deputy Convener. Morning, I'm Lauren Holmes, Head of Services for Cyrenians. Morning everyone, I'm Alex Cole-Hamilton, MSP for Edinburgh Western and Lib Dem Health Spokesperson. Hey, good morning, my name is John McKenzie, I'm a Chief Superintendent within Police Scotland with responsibility for the Safer Communities Department. Uh, good morning, I'm Jenny Goldruth, the MSP for Mid Fife and Glenrothes. Morning, I'm Kula Darani, I'm the Chief Executive of the Scottish Recovery Consortium. Emma Harper, MSP for South Scotland Region. Alison Johnston, MSP for Lothian. Hello, good morning, I'm Fiona Moss, I'm the Head of Health Improvement and Equalities for Glasgow Health and Social Care Partnership and I chair the Prevention Education component of Glasgow Alcohol and Drug Partnership. Uh, good morning, Ivan McKee, MSP for Glasgow Proven. Good morning, Craig says, the clinical lead for prison health care in Forth Valley and the Scotland representative on the RCGP Secure Environment Group. 
Uh, good morning, uh, Brian Whittle, MSP for South of Scotland. Uh, good morning, Sandra White, MSP for Glasgow, Kelvin. Um, Carol Hunter, lead pharmacist with the addiction services in Greater Glasgow and Clyde, and I also manage the needle exchange programme in the health board. Uh, good morning, I'm Deb Stewart, I'm the MSP for Hans Island Region. Thank you very much. I, you will all know that the purpose of our inquiry is to highlight the preventive agenda across health services, but in this particular area to consider whether the uh, strategy in, in relation to substance abuse and the approach to that needs to be revised or, or reviewed or reformed in any way and to gain as much evidence from as many different angles as we can in order to understand that better. Uh, in order to uh, begin our discussions, uh, can I ask Brian Whittle to open uh, for a while? Thank you, good, dinner, and good morning to the panel. I think um, if we could start more on a more uh, general question, uh, I think of some of the evidence that we heard today was around this this uh, belief that uh, people are being parked on methadone um, and that um, it should be part of a, a, a solution, not the, the solution in itself. And given that um, one of the things that I did hear was that, that not enough reviews on the control of methadone um, uh, are put in place, I wondered what the panel's views were as to how the system should work. And, and this, the evidence that we've heard, does that reflect uh, uh, the way in which uh, drug rehabilitation uh, should be carried out. Okay. Yes, Dr. McCreevy. Again, I, I used to run uh, several treatment services within uh, the Glasgow area and within the Forth Valley area, and I currently head up the Scottish Recovery Consortium. So, um, in terms of the the questions you're asking about methadone. Firstly, I'd like to say, would you ask these questions about any other medication that's offered for a serious illness? So they might, that's a question to think about what kind of stigma we might be bringing to the drugs area that we're not bringing to other areas of public health. But in terms of the question, the meat point is, are people being parked on methadone? That's a question the ORT review looked at and said that there was a need for wraparound services for the, the methadone to be a part of that. We in the Scottish Recovery Consortium looked at that review um, and then said, what can we in the recovery community contribute to that? And this tells you about what's good practice. What is good practice is to ask people when they go on the programme when they would like to come off. It's a very obvious question. Where are you seeing this fitting into your recovery journey? Because this is a tool in recovery. And methadone is a helpful, and you've all, nobody's disagreed that it's a helpful tool. It takes people from extreme states of mind and behaviour around having to score drugs to being able to ha find a landing space in order to be able to consider their next steps and to move more cautiously towards a, a, a problem-free, drug-free lifestyle, if that's what they're choosing. So that's the first step. The second step is to invite people to take part in mutual aid support outside of treatment. And what happened in Scotland, which you maybe not have noticed, is that Scotland is unique and we created the ORT Recovery Network, which is a brand new mutual aid to help people come off methadone. And so with that, there are 14 meetings that have been set up by volunteers across Scotland, people in recovery from methadone, to help other people hear the stories of how they come off, get the inspiration and get the help from their peers to come off. And you've heard how peer support is helpful. So in a first case, put people on it, but have a program of when they think they would like to come off and review it regularly. Secondly, there are medications that people are on their whole lives. Antidepressants. Some people are on antidepressants their whole life. Not everyone who has a mental health or mental distress is on antidepressants, but they need to go on it from periods in their life. I wouldn't want to be imposing upon someone's own personal medical care journey at the beginning from outside saying you can only be on this drug for six weeks because we're uncomfortable with that uh, it being on any longer. So in a sense we need to maintain the orange guidelines in, t in terms of methadone, I'm sure Carol knows a lot more of this than I do, but in terms of that, in terms of making a good patient-centred care plan which includes the best available treatment for that problem and also includes a vision of how they're going to come off it. That's what I feel. Thank you very much Carol. I would agree with most of what Kuladani has said there. And I think there is, um, from a pharmacy perspective, there is a role here. There's a lot of untapped potential within the pharmacy profession. And it's interesting that, you know, the three visits from the MSPs, it's all been parked on methadone, but there's been no mention of any alternatives in terms of buprenorphine or heroin-assisted treatment. 
And in terms of pharmacy, um, I mean, the pharmacy profession has most contact with this group of patients, uh, higher contact than, than any other healthcare professional. And I think there's a role for the pharmacist to be more formally involved in, for example, relaxing supervision, identifying patients who are chaotic or destabilising. Um, and I think you know that, that is a role that something that should be looked at. Thank you very much. Are there any, Brian, do you want to come back? Yeah, thank you very much for those responses. I think the question following on from that is I recognise the the. Um, uh, the, the system that's in, that, that you, you're describing that's in place that should be in place. I think the question is that um, do you recognise the the that that's in, perhaps in our evidence that's not necessarily what's happening in all in, in all uh, in all times and in all areas and and, and that perhaps that um, uh, there needs to be a refresh around what good practice is and how do we share that to make sure that that good practice is in evidence across all areas. I would agree with you that there needs to be, that, that that practice is not in evidence. But what I would say is we've had a policy for 10 years and we haven't yet shown that that policy, that the systems to which you're referring that have parked people on methadone are resilient to policy change. So in a sense, you're going to look at how then do we encourage major institutions of the health giving uh, situation of the NHS to actually take on the policies that already exist. And that, to me, has been the challenge in terms of recovery, is how do we see those policies being enacted on the ground? Some areas are doing brilliantly. Some areas are doing brilliantly. In other areas, there's no teeth in requiring them to do that. Okay, thank you. Sandra. Just, just a, a quick question. I mean, others told me that they use other drugs as well as methadone. Uh, you know, I think that's quite unfortunately common in certain circumstances, but you've got 23 years on a particular drug, i.e. methadone, so we're not just... You men, Carol mentioned the fact that there's other substances. Are people advised on that? Because basically, speaking to the folk I spoke to, it was as if that was, that was what they were being told. You're on methadone, and that's it. Uh, what help do they actually get to say you can have a alternative? Okay, so one of the things you need to consider here is you're dealing with current patients... Yeah, so all of the conversations you had were with current patients. So it'd be very good if, and, and I remember some of your conversations with people in longer term recovery. So in a sense, what happens in that we've just written a book which is available on our, on our website, Scottish Recovery Consortium, called Methadone Memoirs. So we did a major piece of work gathering in people's perspectives and stories about their experience on methadone. And what you've described is a very common experience. When we go back into that dialogue, then we look at, actually, our perspective is skewed, and you talked that by the drug that we're on. And so in the current, and what we've seen is a current, an experience of not having heard that they've been offered alternatives. So I saw a front page in the Daily Record a few years ago, which somebody, uh, they face fronted somebody on methadone, you'll have seen it, it was a shocking thing, that said, I've been on this methadone program for X number of years, and, I've, and, and nobody's ever offered me help. Now, none of the treatment services could get on the phone and go, actually, that guy was offered three types of help. Now, he may not have been, but I knew, just looking at the area that he was in, that there were three community rehabs in that area and that there were at least 12 uh, mutual aid meetings, all of which, you know, were trying to help. So you're looking at people's internal experience of, and I'm not doubting their internal experience in that moment, but to get perspective on that experience, you need to go for the whole range of the recovery journey. And many people, who, and I've spoken to, and I've been involved in many people's recovery journey from methadone. Um, and I say I've been involved in supporting this new mutual aid ORT recovery. So I've heard many journeys that their perspective shifts a year in recovery and they start to own responsibility for their part in it. Yes, the treatment service could have been better and yes, they could have been better. So it's not, we're not looking for evil here and we're not looking for bad guys here because I don't think we are. But what I'm saying is it's a complex situation involving people's internal experience and the actual objective reality. And you'll be able to count in any given area, say how many places are available in treatment today? And they should know. And you'll be able to know if that's objectively true or not. And in the case where I saw it there, it wasn't objectively true. There were spaces in community rehabs. Mm -hmm. Listen, I think I had a brief question on this. And then. Um, yes, I mean, I, I think absolutely we don't want to stigmatise anyone who's on a methadone programme any more than we'd want to stigmatise someone who'd been on antidepressants for a long time. But we want to make sure best practice is employed in all situations and that we are using pharmacists 
Um, I, I, we've heard in different inquiries, actually, in this committee that we could be doing far more with our um, pharmacy model than we are. You know, we want to be making sure that no one is parked on any drug unnecessarily, but it's about... Our briefing for today says that Scottish outcome research has shown that while methadone maintenance leads to improved outcomes in a range of domains, it is associated with low rates of sustained abstinence. So I'd just like to understand if the alternatives or if the opportunity to move on beyond methadone is there, you know, in the degree that we'd like it to be. You know, when I went to visit the practice, um, the people I met were really, really keen to get into a residential situation, a 12-week programme. You know, they, they really wanted to, to move on. So I'm just wondering if those alternatives are there. I don't know. That's the short answer. I think that's something you can... I'm not, I'm not going to sit here and go, I definitely know that in Dumfries and Galloway that are, that are follow-on services, because I don't know about Dumfries and Galloway. It hasn't really connected in that sense. Um, but yes, it can always improve. And I, I'm not saying here that it, the situation is fantastic. I'm just saying that you need to find a new tool to encourage um, policy change into practice among the existing treatment services. So yes, we do need an extended uh, community support. And, and in Glasgow, I was involved in community rehabs. That was really good. I'm not no longer involved in treatment provision. I'm involved in campaigning around recovery issues. Yes, um, continued use of abstinence. I know that piece of research. Continued use of methadone, yes, is not associated with uh, abstinence. And long-term employment opportunities, and it's a very small piece of research, are not associated with methadone use either. Now you think about that practically, having to go to medication, pick up your medication on a daily basis, it's not, but it's not preventing people from getting, you know, it, you can work and stay on methadone. However, the point I'm making is people need to be asked when they want to come off and supported off of it, when they're ready. That's the only point I'm making. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. Alison, I know you also had some questions around uh, substance abuse, misuse and prisons, and I wonder if you would like to... Uh, uh, ask. Um, yes, thank you, um. convener. Um, I think, Dr Sayers, in, in your evidence, you highlight a number of areas of concern about drug use in prisons, and I'd just like to understand what the misuse service looks like in prisons. There's a couple of areas in particular that you've um, highlighted that people are much more susceptible to overdose harm on liberation. I'd like you to expand on why that is the case. Um, we, we've had a short inquiry into that in, 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 with the committee, so, so we've heard directly from some prisoners. Um, and I, The abuse of prescription medications obtained through prison GPs, um, you mention that and you say that there's no evidence that they're being illicitly produced, so they must be, you know, prescribed properly, so that, that was a concern too. So if you could expand on those points, I'd be grateful. Yes, thank, thank you. you. Um, as you're aware, we have a high volume of patients using illicit and prescribed medications um, for purposes of intoxication and admission. Uh, and that does continue to a degree within prison is one of our greatest challenges. Uh, in terms of services available, all prisoners admitted are seen by addiction services within one day, um, harm reductions issued. If we have patients for long enough, we offer substitute treatments, mainly in the form of methadone, but also buprenorphine. Um, there is take-home naloxone, which is offered as well for liberation. The reason for drug-related deaths on release is the loss of tolerance to the medications and substances the patients are using on arrival. So it's not uncommon, certainly in the female estate where I mainly work for a long time, um, for patients to be taking in excess of 100, 200 pounds of illicit substances a day. Very quickly, the tolerance to those substances disappear. So on release, a patient's body cannot handle those amounts of drugs and the numbers that I quote, the increased risk of mortality uh, from a recent England and Wales study looking at all prison admissions and liberations over a couple of year period. Uh, and it's quite striking, uh, the risk of death being 50 times greater all-cause mortality in the first two weeks for an equivalent age sex patient on release, 11 times greater uh, in the first four weeks and uh, eight times greater in the first four weeks of drug-related death if not released on a substitute treatment. So there is definitely a prevention of immediate post-release death. So there is a, a driver, a, a keenness from our point of view to have the most vulnerable people liberated on a substitute treatment. 
I fully agree with the comments about not parking people on methadone for 20, 30 years. And we do see patients coming in who, who have no motivation, who, who collect their methadone every four weeks, but there's, there's no objective work going on to try and address that or move that forward. And I think that's where we need to revisit the group of patients who feel parked. Methadone use well can be extremely beneficial for patients. Increasingly, um, the addition of prescription medications is a concern and is notable in terms of gabapentinoids. I've highlighted those because they are the, the biggest difficulty in prison in terms of routine consultations. So prisoners will access gabapentinoids for neuropathic pain is the main reason for nerve pain. Most patients, if examined thoroughly uh, and take a full history, if there is a cause of neuropathic pain, there isn't one. Uh, and you have to have confidence to say no. And unfortunately, you will be aware of the lack of GPs within all services outside, and that mirrors inside. We're also very short of our medical resources. So we're often operating with locums or less experienced GPs who don't have the confidence to say no to patients who can be intimidating and threatening. So it's not necessarily initiated that often in prison, although that does occur. It's more the continuation on admission of a prescription that's given outside, uh, and it's the the reluctance to challenge the prescription. It's far easier just to carry it on. Um, my concern is the recent figures are the gabapentinoid deaths. Uh, and if we notice in 2012, gabapentinoids were present in Scotland in 29 drug-related deaths. That increased to 225 in 2016. Can, can I just um, recent testing suggests that more people are positive for illegal drugs when they're on liberation than they were several years ago, and I just wondered why that might be the case. Um, yeah, I, I, I couldn't speak to that. I, I've seen the prevalence testing results of 30% um, of patients on liberation having uh, illicit substances present. I couldn't really... I, I, I'm struggling to say why that would have increased. Certainly the services and the resources in prison to address drug misuse have increased dramatically. Um, and... Probably I'm surprised because we have reduced the short-term sentences. One of the greatest risks is patients remanded for a matter of weeks or a six-month sentence where patients would serve half of that and maybe get a tag and be out six or seven weeks later. That's an insufficient period of time to address these things in any meaningful way. Uh, and thankfully, over the last four or five years, that number has reduced significantly. So it's disappointing the number's that high, and, and I can't give you a reason as to why it is, considering the patients now we have for a longer period. So you would hope that interventions offered might have reduced the amount of illicit use in prisons, but it doesn't appear to be the case. Can I ask one more question? So it's clear that prisoners need more support when they're liberated um, to, to prevent that overdose situation and obviously homelessness and, and uh, has a part to play in that too. But the NHS, you know, taking responsibility for healthcare in prisons, has that made any difference? Um, it's in, prison sat in isolation in terms of health care up until the transition. Um, so there are pros and cons to this. Um, prior to the transition to the NHS, all Scottish prison health care was delivered via the Scottish Prison Service. So we had uniform prison policy. Our prisoners still move amongst prisons. Now, by moving it to the NHS, that joined up prison network has been lost. We, we tend to work for our health board and it's very hard to get agreed policy amongst all the different health boards because we don't have the forum to get people together anymore. Um, the benefit is, you know, the, the overall health care was poorer prior to transition to the NHS. We now have more support from our primary and secondary care colleagues. But the link on liberation is extremely difficult uh, for a couple of reasons. The computer service within the prisons is quite... Uh, we don't prescribe computer-wise. Apologies, there's no electronic prescribing. So we don't have... When patients come into prison, I can electronically access what medications prisoners are receiving from the GP outside. That doesn't happen on reverse. We therefore have to provide a handwritten letter, which the prisoner may or may not give to their GP. They don't have a GP if they've been in for a sentence over six months, so they have to re-register. That can be difficult. It's very difficult, if not impossible, to arrange that in advance because you more often than not don't have an address the patient is going to. So the through care out is difficult uh, and would be addressed by provision, well, would be certainly improved by provision of accommodation prior to release so we could have a GP set up in advance. Um, I appreciate that's 
difficult, but that, that is a big barrier to a smooth through care. Yes, I agree, Mickey. Thanks very much, um, convener, um, and thanks everybody for coming along to talk to us this morning. Very much value your your input on this. Um, just touching on the prisons issue, I've got Berlini in my constituency, which I've visited a number of times, um, and I think we've seen from the, the evidence that the Alison Johnson mentioned the significant increase in the prevalence on release, which is clearly something not working there. But I'd like to explore a bit, a bit more detail around about the, um, the issues on release and how we join that up, because it looks like we can all agree there's a significant problem there. Um, and I think others around the table will probably have input on that, um, because obviously it affects the services that, that pick up the pieces, if you like, on the outside. But it also does sound like there's some simple practical things that we could do with some joined up thinking and procedures there. I don't know if you maybe want to talk through that, and I'm sure others would want to want to come in as well. Yeah, I mean, the key things that would improve from a personal point of view is if we had access and registration with the GP prior to release, we could transfer information, not just about medication, about all healthcare interventions received in prison. Um, one of the difficulties with some of the larger jails, Barlini will have mainly patients from Glasgow, but more distant. Uh, Quantum Vale has changed over the last few years with where the female population is distributed, but previously housed all women from a national basis. It's incredibly difficult to arrange through care for Aberdeen, for Dumfries, for long distances away. So I appreciate the community facing units are being introduced and I'm hopeful that by having those with prisoners working with people who they will continue to work with on release should smooth that transition back out and probably increase engagement on release as opposed to just meeting an, a named person they've never met before. Um, hopefully if that model has some improvement of uptake and through care to all services, housing, employment, college, uh, healthcare, addictions, you know, maybe there's the potential in the future to expand that to the male estate as well, but it, it's the transition is the big, the big difficulty. I just wanted to pick up quickly on one point that the Craig had made, and that was about, he described the pathway when a prisoner came in and he, he looked on the records and he had access to the GP records. And what that would tell him was when the prescription, we're talking about methadone here, buprenorphine, for example, when that was last prescribed. But what it doesn't tell you is when it was last consumed. And that's a really important point. And the only place that information is, is in the pharmacy. Um, and I think that is a really strong argument for linking up the pharmacy as well to, to the patient records. And the same when someone's <coughs> being discharged. Yeah, well, well, in most cases, methadone is prescribed by a secondary care CAT team, which doesn't appear on the electronic record. So that medication, unless it is GP prescribed, we actually phone the service, A, to let them know where the patient is, but on top of that, I also phone the pharmacy to confirm the last collection date as well and whether that was supervised. It would be really good if we were all linked up. It would be far better, yes. absolutely, <laughs> yes. That's, that's, that's a, a, good, a good message to drop, down the clinic. I expected to be talking about because I talk about recovery, but actually I happened to run one of the prison through care from Corton Vale. I worked from Corton Vale. I set up the 218 service for women who uh, use drugs in order to uh, commit crime in order to fund the drug use. So I've got about 10 years experience in this. People use drugs in prison because they're in pain. People die on the way out of prison because they're a population in movement. There are population and movement, and we have difficulty dealing with populations and movement. The colleague of yours that went and saw that homelessness was a big issue in terms of being able to get consistent service. If you consider that everyone in prison is now homeless, they are a population and movement. They are in pain the same way that people in the streets are in pain, but in any, any immediate cause of dislocation, whether their, their family's busted up or whether they've been pulled out of prison, they're more likely to be using drugs to soothe their dis discomfort and their pain. That's why people, that's why more people die, because there, there are more people in pain. So in terms of you can work, and all of these conversations I've been party to, I have set up through care, I did lib day lifts from Corton Vale, took women direct from Corton Vale to their home, bypassing all the opportunities to use drugs in the city centre and, and try to get them connected up to a service. We try to create a service. I'm not saying don't do that. Continue with the efforts to do that. But there's a bigger question that we fail to look when we try and look at, let's get a technical fix between your computer and your computer. The <coughs> fact is we've got a population in movement and we're not good at dealing with populations in distress in movement. 
The preventative agenda is very hard to link up with the treatment agenda because you're asking the wrong question. You're asking the question of how can a policy if make it that women in Cortonville doesn't die on the way, rather than, and you're seeing it in isolation. You're seeing that women in Cortonville in isolation. And some of the messages you've got from mental health is that you're not seeing the mental health at the same time. Most of the women in Cortonville had extreme mental health problems as well as drugs. They're the tip of the iceberg. But when you put the whole prevention, this is about prevention. If you do stop isolating drugs and alcohol behaviour in the community, as if you can isolate that and put it together with the whole ranges of ways that we as a human population are expressing our distress, you will see that across all those indices, they're an increase. Suicide is on the increase. Depression is on the increase. Obesity is on the increase. And that's what my overall point that I want to leave here without making. Don't go too small. You'll stick with a technical fix when we need a paradigm shift. We need a complete sea change in how we look at this. All of these problems are real and you can do all of that you've said. Great. But we need a bigger thinking. Thank you. I think we need a bit of both in, in truth. Alex. We do. Thank, Thank you, you convener. Good morning, everyone. Um, my question stems very neatly from that. Um, it's, it strikes me that um, what we've heard from the prison uh, services that are around, represented around the table is that that focus is very much on physiological stabilisation, recovery, treatment and the rest of it. But just picking up on the last point, I think that a lot of drug use, most drug use, um, is, as we heard, an antidote to pain that people are experiencing. Oftentimes it's a human response to trauma that is not resolved, it's, uh, it's cyclical and it, it's self-sustaining. So to that end, what additional services bolted into the prison offer um, are there specifically to address trauma recovery um, and indeed mental health recovery in, in that respect to, to stem the original catalyst to drug misuse? Yes, I mean, all prisons have an extensive team of mental health nurses supported by psychology uh, and visiting forensic psychiatrists. We acknowledge, particularly in the female group, but also in the male group, that the drugs are a symptom of a coping strategy. That happens outside, and if they're able to use drugs within prison to address that coping, to use it as a coping strategy, we fully understand that. In terms of moving that forward, they the patient focus usually on coming in is their physical health, uh, their actual physical withdrawals. So you need a week, two weeks to remove the illicit substances from the person to get them not concentrating on the physical health and then offer them the opportunity to engage with mental health services. That goes hand in hand with the addiction services. Quite often the addictions nurses are their mental health nurse at the same time. The key thing, and that's why I mentioned the short sentences, it's welcomed there, less of those to effectively intervene to deliver CBT or counselling needs to be with the same person for a significant period of time. So it would be wrong to open a can of worms of some of our uh, females' child sexual abuse for a matter of two or three weeks. You will make the emotions worse. Uh, and then if they walk out of the door with the head struggling, they're going to go back to what they know. So it's having people for a sufficient period of time telling them what we offer, uh, and pretty much almost back to the initial comments about instead of just parking somebody on a treatment and leaving them, planning this journey with them and saying, what are your issues? What do you feel ready to tackle at this time? And working through one thing at a time. And that may be their uh, mental health issues. It may be they are more focused on addressing hepatitis C treatment, but it is using substitute treatments, if we are going to use them, to help the patient work through their mental pain and physical pain or whatever issues they have with a view to at the end all be that outside prison or in the long sentence within prison reducing and stopping so there needs to be a, a full journey in there are extensive mental health services um within all prisons and and patients in addictions mental health and addictions goes hand in hand they're not separate issues i agree and, and actually, I had a follow-up, which, again, stems very nicely from that. Um, and you talked quite a lot about uh, the impact of short-term sentencing on your ability or lack thereof to actually make a meaningful difference in stabilising and treating and helping um, uh, prisoners to recover. Um, without wanting to draw you in to endorse Lib Dem policies around legalisation and decriminalisation, do you think that our Scottish courts should 
consider addiction and substance misuse when they hand down sentencing because they know that we have an opportunity there to actually meaningfully address some of these issues but there's no point doing it if in some cases you're only talking about I know we've got a presumption against short-term sentencing but we all know that sentencing of less than six months still happens and people are liberated within three months of that should we actually completely radically reform our sentencing agenda when it comes to um, drug related crime so that we can do something meaningful with these people or just treat them in the community rather than taking them into incarceration. I'd certainly welcome that. The, the use of the DTTOs has been, many of our prisoners come in have already been on a DTTO. <laughs> Lots of faces I've dealt with over the last 15, 20 years uh, have used a DTTO well uh, and uh, haven't come back to us. So there are certainly successes there. Um, if ultimately people have been in that route or don't wish to engage in a DTTO or the court feels a sentence in prison is required. From my perspective, it needs to be of a sufficient duration to do anything meaningful. So yeah, the shorter sentences are, they introduce risk for decreased tolerance overdose on release, don't really afford us an opportunity to do meaningful work. Yeah. <coughs> I think when we're speaking about people, as Caledani pointed out, of people who are in pain, we're asking them to invest in the services that we're offering them. And in order to do that, they need to have trusted relationships. Those relationships need to be able to follow people. And instead, we're putting them into systems that only work with them for short periods of time. We're looking at health boards that can't work across boundaries. We're looking at prisons who are geographically serviced. I think that there are solutions, and I think that the third sector are in an ideal position in order to bring some of that, because we can work with people across those boundaries. Um, and I think that it's incredibly important at this stage that we don't overlook the importance of those trusted relationships for people. These are people who have been let down at every point in their lives, and if we're only going to engage with them for very short periods of time, why would they work with us? Why would they engage in what we say we're going to offer and the help that we're going to give them? Really fair point. Emma Harper. Just a quick point, back to the beginning of uh, Craig's point about national digital prescribing, which would link prison GPs, pharmacies. That was raised to me in the um, Friday session last week when I spoke to staff members and um, the fact that many complaints in prison that come from the fact that I'm not getting the drugs that I want where there are other interventions that are non-prescribing that could be delivered as well so just your thoughts on national prescribing and the other issue was about addressing adverse childhood experience that came up from the staff members but the service users did not use that language at all about any trauma that they had experienced in childhood one service user blamed the fact that he was coming home to Dumfries, Sparkfee, elsewhere, and it was the place that caused him to take heroin again after being 14 years clean. So that was interesting for me that there was no issue around uh, his own personal like, history. Um, certainly, you mean from, a, from an overall point of view, from a big prisoner, point, prisoner number point of view, um, there are past traumas, not just childhood, you know, young adulthood and, and late adulthood. So the drugs are certainly used not for fun by the time I'm getting them. They are using to blank them out. In terms of the electronic sort of prescribing side of things that you mentioned there, um, the point is, are you... The, the complaints about not receiving medication probably are because there is a doctor capable of saying no. So in certainly my experience, any complaints about medication, about not getting medication, has not been an oversight or we haven't chased it up properly. The majority are because when patients are coming in on commodity medications, which are traded in prison, the gabapentinoids, sleeping tablets, benzodiazepines, opiate analgesia, which are maybe not felt to be clinically justified and are stopped by the clinician, that tends to be the complaints. But to me, that would be good clinical practice. So I don't think that would be improved by electronic prescribing. The electronic prescribing for us would help more if it could join up to GP uh, services, more for the getting back out of the way. Uh, the electronic prescribing for the whole system and the complaints process, what the feedback I got was that positive prescribing it's isn't just about giving people what they want it's about giving them what they need so you mean complaints about on release they weren't getting medication yeah, yeah okay I, and unfortunately that is there are several reasons for that the fact that we can't co directly communicate with a gp uh, electronically the handwritten paper liberation note and supply of medication uh, i am well aware of 
many of our prisoners represent who I know have received this, who've presented to a GP to register, but if that doesn't have on what they may be seeking, they will suggest they're on other medication and often receive that medication. So it would safety net the GP outside as well. They do have the option in the same way that I have, if they're not sure, to ring into the prison uh, to say, what was this patient on on release? But we don't really get many calls that way. Area, but I'm keen to move on and, and hear from uh, uh, some of our other witnesses as well. Emma, did you have a question also on the uh, security of uh, uh, police uh, or on, on the handling of substance misuse issues from the police point of view? Or perhaps that was Jenny. It was Jenny. Ruth, it was yeah. Jenny. My apologies, Jenny. Thank you, Convener. Um, my question actually links into uh, some of what Alex Hamilton spoke about with regard to trauma. Um, the Police Scotland submission mentions that more could be done to identify the drivers to problem drug use and tackle these underlying factors collectively. Um, and you also mentioned social inequality and ACEs in that part of the submission. Um, and again, in the Glasgow submission, you talk about a stronger recognition of adverse childhood experiences and trauma as a predictive risk for drug use and misuse. Um, However, only just under 4% of your spend is on preventative spend. So there is a disconnect there with the rhetoric, obviously, with your submission and actually what's happening on the ground. What do you think needs to be done in terms of joining up services to identify childhood trauma when it happens and identify those risk factors? Because we're hearing week in, week out on this committee about the disconnect between the health system and the education system. The education system at the moment, which is tasked with closing a poverty-related attainment gap and dealing with a lot of the problems that we are identifying here today. So I just wonder what work you might do with local schools or do you think that's where the disconnect is happening? Or is it a bigger problem than just health and education not talking to each other? Uh, I'll, I'll start for you on it. The, the, um, I, I'm not convinced that the sort of terms about health and education, uh, sorry, police and education not speaking with each other is, is a sort of accurate reflection. And from a police perspective, and just if I may, when you talk about the, the quantity spent on prevention, I, would just can, I mean, police are, are in this role whereby we have a number of areas that we address in terms of the prevention aspect, but we will always... Um, pursue the aspect of enforcement and we will always pursue the aspect of intelligence gathering in relation to the, the wider drug issue. But just in terms of the aspect of prevention, um, I think there is a lot of good work actually taking place between partners, health, education, police, third sector, um, in relation to the issue of drug use. We've highlighted within the submission the, um, the work ongoing in relation to work in schools in terms of education and that's obviously clearly a primary issue to address some of the longer term impacts in relation to drug misuse within our communities. The aspect of ACEs is an interesting term that's came up um, recently and actually I would refer, actually I think ACEs has been dealt with in Scotland since 2004 under getting it right for every child. I mean that is ultimately um, a number of key factors of ACEs in terms of how we work collectively. So if you look at the getting it right for every child piece of work that's undergoing across agencies, actually that can be transposed into the area of ACEs also. Obviously there's other aspects within ACEs that talk about poverty, it talks about uh, incarceration within the, the ACEs um, piece of work. However, um, there are areas which we work collectively um, and I think the, the challenge here is it's that point of evaluation, isn't it? It's that understanding of the work we do, how does that then prevent on a longer term basis and how then you evaluate that piece of work. Um, but the misnomer that agencies aren't working hard, aren't working collectively, I would suggest is an, an inaccurate uh, comment to make, actually. I don't think it's that agencies aren't working hard enough. I think it's that there is a disconnect. And we've certainly taken evidence uh, before from Harry Burns, actually, who spoke about Griffith. Mm -hmm. And he, you know, was very complimentary about the system. But what he said was, actually, it's not going far enough. And on the ground, we're not joining up that knowledge uh, with professionals and highlighting where risk could be, uh, I suppose, intervened at, at an earlier stage in the process. So, for example, when children at school in primary one perhaps are uh, coming to school and don't have enough speech and language skills at that age, at, at you know primary one, so age five level, mm -hmm. that information should be communicated at an earlier level. And that might be a wider indication of trauma or things that have happened in that child's life at an earlier stage. So I guess it's about the systems talking to each other. And that's certainly something that's come through in a lot of our evidence, that there is a disconnect. It's not that systems aren't working hard enough, it's just they don't see 
seem to talk to each other. Yeah, and I, I anticipate that, um, you know, the aspect and uh, if we were to then talk about the name person process, I think that was an, a, an attempt to actually allow agencies to identify okay. issues within education at an early stage and has a number of positive aspects to it. So there have been attempts by agencies to actually progress this matter, to understand how you, un uh, how you identify issues of trauma and early stage. Education is a key role, mm -hmm. as does health, but actually name person was one of those yeah. areas that actually was hopefully going to, and hopefully will, um, move on to, uh, to, to assist that. Mm -hmm. that. Um, and I think that is the issue, actually, the mechanism to allow agencies to speak, to share data, to share data um, on, a legal, on a legal framework. I think that is a challenge that has to be overcome, and I think that is an issue that is, has existed for the last couple of years, certainly, uh, with regards to the name person service. Sure. Thank you very much. Uh, I think you've covered a lot of issues for us there, and certainly um, I sit here and I think quite defensively, yes, we are absolutely working uh, well together, um, but you always do that when you're challenged. Um, within um, Glasgow, we are building together the work we're doing around prevention for community justice, the work we're doing around child poverty and uh, addiction prevention. We've got a, a prevention forum, but the challenge is we could always do more, and you get pockets where it works extremely well together because people get it, they get the same language and they work well together and you get other pockets where that doesn't happen. So I don't think any of us in this room would probably say we've got it all uh, tied together um, uh, fundamentally. I think the issue around drugs prevention and your opening question was around is, is drugs prevention where it needs to be in our road to recovery strategy? And I would say no, it's not. We have actually done an awful lot with education, but that's only one of many areas of prevention work that we need to do. In Greater Glasgow, Glasgow and Clyde, we have our model that has 12 component parts. Education is one of those 12. And I think it's making sure the other 11 are very strong as well. And nationally, where I think we need to do more is working with, um, with people that are more vulnerable to addictions. Whether it's through childhood trauma or other reasons, there are a whole range of people that we do not have the range of engagement with and support for to make prevention really come alive. We've been doing some work around what we've called uh, constructive connections, which is working with families affected by the justice system and addiction, and particularly the children within those families. And what's become very, very evident to us from that work is the stigma associated with that and the way that young people are trying to keep themselves distant from some of that stigma and how do we actually engage with young people to be able to support them with what they're experiencing there's a lot that we're yet to discover around needs and vulnerabilities and how we actually work uh, around issues. We've also been doing some work doing trauma needs assessment uh, for uh, staff working within prison and within addiction services. To what extent are staff that are actually supporting people uh, with addictions actually trauma aware and what learning and education needs do they have? Now this all comes into prevention but unless you've got a broader scope of prevention you won't see it, you won't investigate it and you won't address it. Do you have a follow-up, Jenny? Thanks. David. Uh, thank you, Convener. I think Fiona Moss has uh, very helpfully uh, linked into the question I'm interested in, which is understanding a bit more about the role of stigma in treatment. Is stigma a real issue when it comes uh, to treatment in Scotland today? Yes. <laughs> yes. Absolutely. Um, and for just in terms of the young people that we were working with, um, to the point of which... Uh, young people would not necessarily know that their, their parent was in prison uh, and addiction issues, or if they knew, they wouldn't tell anybody at all. And if that's not stigma that, that maybe prevents you from getting your emotional issues dealt mm. with that might have longer term impacts on you as an individual, I don't know what is. Mm. And do you believe there's a, a hierarchy of stigma, sort of multiple layers of exclusion, such as homelessness, mental illness and drug injecting? Absolutely, yes. I would agree with that. 
there is a hierarchy. And I think there are certain, uh, there, there are cultural patterns to stigma as well. Something could be quite stigmatising just now, but in a couple of years' time is more acceptable, but something else comes along. So it's not as if we have stigma and it just stays there. Uh, it, it's absolutely embedded and it changes with our culture. I'll be obviously for other people to come as well, but perhaps I'll throw out another question. And I was very interested in the 2016 Scottish Government Social Attitudes Survey. And as the panel will know, when it was very contradictory. At one hand, it said that people were basically very tolerant of people uh, that injected drugs. But the key point was that they wouldn't want them living next door to them. Do people understand that, that contradiction? And I would be grateful if the panel could cast some more light on that Scottish Government survey. Survey because we we sponsored it in the first initiative. Oh, right. It was a rubbish survey, <laughs> and they'd ask my opinion. Is this a technical term? Uh, no, it's a <laughs> so can I give you the um, when did you stop beating your wife question? That classic question that managed to get through an ethics question was, would you live next door to a drug user? Is anybody going to answer yes? Is anybody going to actively answer yes to that question? When you say, would you live next door to a woman who's struggling a bit? Yeah, I do. Would you live next door to uh, somebody who's had a bit of trouble this week? Yeah, I already do. Do you already live next door to somebody who's using alcohol, popping pills on antidepressants? Yes, I do. But if you say, do you want to live next door to a drug user? I don't know anybody who's going to put their hands up and say yes, and I've worked in the field for 20 years, and I'm in personal recovery. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? So it's like, what are you saying? That's what I'm saying. It's a question, when did you stop beating your wife? Mm -hmm. There's no way you can answer that question and come out with it. Mm -hmm. We've recently done, we had an event of, for 350 representatives of Scotland's recovery communities in the tramway in September last year and carried out a new piece of, uh, around the theme of stigma. And, we've, and I've, I've got the draft report. It'll be available for you um, within the next month. What we discovered was that people, 96% of the participants do experience stigma in their lives. They experience it as a, in a way that's preventing them from accessing services. We know that. The stigma around addiction and the stigma that we're all part of creating is preventing people from seeking help. Not me. It's mm. them. I didn't seek help because I wasn't one of them. Mm. Do you know what I mean? I'm an educated woman that runs a business. I, I'm not one of them. Mm. And then when I discovered, yes, I am. And I had to get over myself first to get help. So in terms of stigma, it prevents people. But what we do know is visibility of recovery, the visible face of recovery, which I'm doing right now, accidentally, um, is it allows people to go, oh, it's possible to get better. So they're more liable to seek help. That's what we do with the recovery work. So yeah, in terms of stigma, it is there. Public services were found to be the most damaging place to experience stigma. Not businesses, not in the street, not the name calling, but when you rock up to a service and ask for help, these were the ones that people came back mm. and said were the most damaging experience of stigma. Mm. So that's the most recent research we've done. People are still experiencing it, and the most damaging places is not where we expected it to be. Mm. It's in the services. So would you suggest that the 2016 survey should be rerun with more balanced questions? You might get more, a fairer representation of what people actually feel. I think we shouldn't do it. I think we should do something else altogether. Right. Thank you. Thank you very much. John McKenzie. Thank you. Um, Actually, it's an interesting point you make about stigma, and reference has been made to the tramway event, which was a fantastic event that day. Um, and even coming here today demonstrates the issue and the difficulty of this subject uh, in terms of some media outlets and actually the perception that actually the police shouldn't even be involved in this conversation or shouldn't be involved in the conversation about stigma. And that in itself uh, raises uh, concerns in relation to how society stigmatises the issue of drugs. I mean, uh, and convener, if I may, I just want to, to make a, a point on that aspect of stigma and just open it up slightly, just from a police perspective. Um, if police were not involved in the wider conversation about stigma and the public health aspect of drug misuse within our society, the question should be raised by the public, why? Last week we had uh, plaudits across the world about 70% reduction in knife crime, and we've taken a public health uh, approach to knife crime. Actually, I don't see any different with regards to this subject matter. Um, and in addition, you have a situation whereby uh, a few weeks ago, the bravery of officers, the bravery of members of the public resulted in 87 years of incarceration time being placed on an organised crime group. But actually still today, when we come here to have this discussion about the issue of public health, we, are, we find ourselves criticised because we are 
using terms such as the stigma aspect linked to drug misuse within society. It's just an interesting dynamic across some media outlets that actually don't have a balanced approach to the whole subject matter. Thank you, Convener. That's very helpful. Brian, I think you had a follow-up. I think, I think um, one of the things I, w I was interested in, especially around uh, sort, of the, the, sort of the police involvement, police intervention, is around, you know, you, you have to work to directives uh, that you're given. And I just wondered what, you know, in general terms, for my benefit, what kind of directives are you given in terms of when, when, when you're interacting? Because obviously you will come across, your officers will come across drug misuse and drug users all the time. And what, what what is your directive in that particular in those particular instances? You know, what what's your, what objectives are you given to work with? Well, I, th I think our directives are quite clear. There's a legislative framework in which we work to under the Misuse of Drugs Act. Uh, the Lord Advocate's position is clear. Um, however, let me uh, make a point here. That doesn't mean that we do not recognise individuals who are substance users, stroke abusers, who may have wider issues such as mental health, other. Uh, challenges within their life that actually we undertake all possible action in terms of referring um, individuals to agencies. Now you yourself highlighted within your opening comments about the challenges of actually getting agencies in which you uh, can refer to and that is a challenge certainly. But in terms of the directive to officers, officers are clear we work to legislation but we also have the challenge of ensuring that we protect people at harm within our communities and that means that we are a, f a referring agency into partner agencies to try and support individuals who are drug users, stroke abusers, and that is the, the position that we will hold. Um, and the other aspect is the issue of drugs is multifaceted. We recognise that we cannot um, impact on the issue of demand uh, as a single agency. It's a collective, uh, it's a collective um, approach. Um, but we will continue to work with regards to the, um, the legislation, legislative framework we have. And interesting, in the 2008 uh, strategy, there is a chapter about enforcement. I think we'd be keen to continue to have at least reference to enforcement within any new strategy that exists. But again, we've made a position clear within that chapter about enforcement, what our aims are in terms of tackling serious and organised crime, ensuring that the framework, uh, ensuring the legislation is adhered to. Um, but we will refer individuals who have wider challenges in life. Thank you very much. Very, very quickly, yeah. Brian. We're, we're so just to clarify time. then, that you do have latitude then within within the law to do that kind of referral and, 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 and looking at the greater health issue rather than a judicial issue. So you have that ability to work with other, other agencies. Well, we have the latitude in as much as there is a, a two uh, a two route approach here. There is the legislative approach in terms of uh, reporting the set of circumstances if indeed uh, a criminal act has taken place. But that doesn't prevent us considering the wider health-based issues or the wider partnership opportunities that exist to refer individuals in. And we will always, always ensure that Crown officers are clear of the wider circumstances so that a, a judgment can be made is the criminal justice process an appropriate process to be adopted. That is, that is a decision for Crown, ultimately to make, but we have the opportunity to refer into wider agencies, absolutely. Okay, thank you very much. Ivan. Uh, thanks, um, Yeah, I just want to take a, a wee step back, and maybe we should have had this, this question earlier, but just to kind of set the scene, I'm looking at the data points that we've got in the evidence that, that we've seen, um, and it's kind of quite confusing. We're seeing a situation where the data says drug use is down, but deaths are up, the age profile is changing, maybe that's part of the, the driver for the deaths, I don't know. Um, the uh, prevalence looks to be flat, uh, hospital admissions that are drug-related are up, and we've talked about prisons as well. So I don't know if anybody's got any kind of comments on, in a general sense, whether we think we're making we're making progress over the last uh, last number of years and what data there is to, to evidence that. And, and, and just a, a very small point on that, something that occurred to me. Uh, when we have this data, maybe Spice can go and look at it, but I'd be interested to know of the the drug deaths, how many of those individuals had been through the prison system. I think that would be a very interesting data point. Does anyone want to respond on that on that data question? Um. Um, I don't know the data of the number uh, of drug related. I know that we've seen previously that uh, about 90% of all patients within CAT teams have been through the prison system within a five year period. So there's a, there's a huge Currently, it's the same population. So, in terms of the actual number of deaths, and particularly within those early deaths, uh, I couldn't give the exact number, but it's 
it's the same group uh, transitioning between services. Quick point on the data that we have from the needle needle exchanges, um, and that that does reflect much much of what's just been said there. In terms of we we see the most common age group is 35 to 39, and it's predominantly heroin injectors, opiate injectors that we have. But by far the um, the second biggest group that we have are those, and we ha hasn't been mentioned today at all, and doesn't doesn't appear in any strategy, is those who are injecting and using image and performance enhancing drugs, and that is our second biggest uh, number. Um, and interestingly enough, it's a much younger age group. So, you know, the, the risks are, some of the risks are the same, but, you know, some are different, uh, but there are definitely health harms and health risks there. Yes, please. The question to ask is, put together the drug death increase with the alcohol death increase, with the suicide increase, with the increase in obesity, and ask ourselves the bigger question of, how can we look at all of this distress in our culture in a much more proactive way? You were talking about ACEs. ACEs do not re re restrict themselves to people with alcohol or drug problems or depression. 60% of the population will score frequently on ACEs. I score 10, but you know, you can only work well. Um, so in a sense, um, the big question is, can we put it all together? And these are all the diseases, as, as Phil Hanlon says in the fifth wave of public health, these are the diseases of modernity. Each one is a symptom of a greater malaise that's going on. And, and until you at attack them and look at those deep-seated difficulties in our culture, we're, we're just going to be moving things from one place to another, looking, can we solve the drug problem? The alcohol problem goes up. We put the alcohol one, the drug one, it's going to be like that. We have to sit back and go, actually, this data is telling us something quite extreme about Scotland, particularly, that we're still suffering in a way that we didn't expect. That's all. I was going to pick up partly on that issue. I think um, the, the, the drugs issue is a complex issue. So if you went to any single um, data source, it would give you a skewed picture. You do have to look at it in the ground. We are seeing some positive moves in terms of reporting by young people around drug use and a whole range of other things, which are, are, are good indicators. And at the same time, we're seeing some really concerning issues. In Glasgow ADP, we actually uh, had a meeting dedicated looking at our drug deaths, our alcohol deaths, and our suicide deaths, to try and look across the piece at what is actually going on here for us in the city and what can we do about it. And actually piecing together some of the policy and some of the change is one of the areas we have to do. We have to put together what's going on in community planning around local regeneration. We have to put together what's going on in a mental health strategy. We have to put together around our alcohol and drug work and our children's work. And I think in terms of a road to recovery, perhaps it's not linking those strategic elements enough and enabling us to work across agendas to actually be able to do that. For our final line of questioning, uh, can I hand over to Ash? Thanks, Convener. Um, I've read in the paper that only about 30% of um, problem drug users are women, but they might have um, specific circumstances and specific experiences that are maybe different from um, their male counterparts. So I was wondering if anybody could um, shed a bit of light on maybe um, the differing patterns of behaviour and risks um, for women problem drug users. Anyone want to kick off? Yes, please. To date. Um, I think we, can, we need to take an equality-sensitive approach to all the work we do. So there, are, there will always be gender issues in there. There will be other issues in there as well. Um, and it doesn't just relate to your drug taking patterns, it relates to all the other aspects of your life as well. We've certainly found, uh, and we've seen that within our uh, addiction services in Glasgow, there are components where women have asked us, can we do something different? Because we need it. Um, but it's being able to bring that equality sensitive approach to our prevention, our treatment, and our recovery work that is absolutely critical. And so what makes it different you know, is that women are at the bottom of the pile. So if um, a man is using his drugs, and this is from, I mean, I'm going to quote my experience. I, ran the two, I set up and ran the 218 service and ran the turnaround service in prison. So I've got 10 years' experience working directly with women who commit crime in order to fund their drug use. 
They were at the bottom of every pile, so the lowest of every denominator. So a man who's using drugs maybe often has a woman in the background or a family member in the background who's helping him keep his life together. When a woman goes down, the kids go down, the whole, thing, whole ship goes down, and, and she's got nowhere else to go. When a woman goes down and is working the streets to fund her drug use, there isn't anywhere lower you can go in terms of society's stigma, and it's a belief in you, and it's disbelief in you as a human being and as a potential human being. So yeah, women will be raped, starved, kidnapped, attempt murder, violently abused in order to chain their drug, uh, to get their drug use. So yeah, they, when they go down, they go down further and faster and harder, and it's harder to come back up. So in terms of working with women to come, women-sensitive, trauma-sensitive services is what I set up, but trauma-sensitive services, but also women's spaces um, where women can reconnect with being a woman as part of their journey to, to becoming more well, um, because often they had lost that. Yeah. Thank you. So you spoke about particular um, services that are targeted um, to be beneficial to women. Do you think services in general, are, I mean, are they isolated or do you think across the system there's enough services that target, you know, specific vulnerable groups like women? Um, and I think I'm open to my colleagues who are more up to date because I say I've been off the field. But in terms of uh, gender specific, and I'm not just talking about women gender, but I'm talking about men gender, gender specific groups are a helpful part in any recovery program because you're safer generally speaking, in a gender. Women can be vulnerable to predation in early recovery and also can be very, and, and can be very vulnerable to seeking approval through sexual behaviour um, because that's what they're used to trading in. You know? So there aren't any safe people generally for women, um, but you're trying to create a safe environment. So creating safety for any gender group. And I have to say, we found that in the sense we did some experiment with male prisoners coming out. I can also say that male suicide in prison is just as high as women at times. Um, and that male gender groups were also helpful in helping men you know, uh, in their long-term recovery journey. So I think gendered approaches are helpful additions. Sandra, I think a very brief final Just very, question. Yeah, I mean, obviously, the evidence I heard from the women that I spoke to, basically, they felt as though they suffered stigma more than others, uh, and because they were seen as a bad mother, etc. And they would go out to use the drugs to steal money, etc. Not just to feed the drug habit, to feed their kids as well. So you're absolutely spot on. But what they asked for was uh, more rehab centres for women. They said they were at the bottom of the pile, and also rehab centres for women and their children to be able to go along, backed up, obviously, with, with help as well. So I just wanted to would you agree that there's not enough rehab centres for, for women, not enough support out there for women trying to get off drugs? I wouldn't like to make a comment on the existing service right now, but it's worth the exploring. There used to be women's rehabs, too, in Glasgow, and they were closed down because of, I don't know why, fully. Mm. It may well have been that they were not meeting the the, the, the outcomes that were necessary. When we created recovery programmes and recovery ch to change the landscape, community rehabs, day rehabs were found to be really helpful for everybody across the board, women and men, because you're allowed to keep your house. If you go into a residential rehab, then you become part of this homeless population again. You've lost your house. Um, women and children support, very helpful. That's a complex issue. It needs a bit more look. I ran services for women for 10 years, and I can tell you I needed a, a, a nursery <sighs> twice. Thank you very much. Yeah. And finally, finally, L Lorna, I wonder if I could ask you from the Serenians perspective uh, around the wider issue of prevention and, and particularly the role that general practice might play, if there's anything uh, you, you would like us to note on that. Yeah, I mean, certainly our, our experiences, we run dedicated recovery services in West Lothian, but across all of the work that Serenians do, we, we touch on recovery due to the, the homeless nature of, of the work that we do in working with rough, rough sleepers. Um, I think going back to when we started the conversation today, we definitely feel that there's a much larger role for GPs to play um, in terms of signposting people into recovery services, um, in terms of understanding that there's more to people's recovery than just prescribing um, substitute prescriptions for people. Um, I, I absolutely came here today thinking about recovery and speaking about recovery. Um, and in terms of prevention, I think that there are three separate elements that we absolutely need to think about and be aware of. And that's the prevention that takes the prevention work that takes place in schools and in terms of ensuring that people don't go down the pathway into substance misuse in the first instance. We then need to look at the prevention of harm when people are misusing substances and the prevention of relapse when people are on their recovery journeys. And each is of equal importance 
when we're looking at, at substance misuse to people. Um, and hopefully, I, I get a real sense that there's a, a real appetite to look at the systems that sit round about the work that we do and a real appetite for systems change in relation to that. And we're incredibly hopeful at Cyrenians at the moment that the right conversations are taking place to allow us to support people better moving forward in that journey. I think that's a very positive note on which to conclude our round table discussion and I think it does reflect the evidence we've heard this morning. So can I thank all the witnesses very much for coming in and giving us of your experience and knowledge and I'll suspend the session briefly uh, to allow witnesses uh, to move on. Thank you very much.
much, colleagues. We will resume our formal session uh, now. And welcome to the committee, uh, David Little, the Chief Executive Officer of Scottish Drugs Forum, uh, Andrew Horn, the Director of Ad Action Scotland, Emma Crawshaw, Chief Executive Officer of Crew 2000 Scotland, Theresa Medhurst, the Director of Strategy and Innovation with the Scottish Prison Service, and Dr Adam Brodie of the Faculty of Addictions Psychiatry from the Royal College of Psychiatrists in Scotland. So I, I think we'll go straight to the first question, if we may. Uh, as we have so many excellent witnesses in the course of two sessions this morning, we are tight for time. Uh, but of course, uh, the first question, I, I think, will give you uh, witnesses an opportunity to answer the question, but also uh, touch on any wider points they wish to do. David Stewart. For coming along and providing your expertise uh, to us. As you heard from the previous session, I'm very interested in stigma. And I know from the 1970s, there was quite a lot of academic work done around stigma. I think on memory, it was Irving Goffman's famous book. Do you see stigma then as being a big barrier to treatment uh, in Scotland today? Who would like to start? Will I kick off? Um, yep. Yeah. Uh, Absolutely, stigma is a is a huge issue that, that we face, and of course, uh, as you've you know highlighted, that there's a whole hierarchy of, of 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 stigma, and I think that's the the real challenge in knowing how to deal with that, because there there are different stigmas for people in long term recovery compared to those who are currently using, and I think that's also touches on the discussion we've had earlier that today around methadone, where actually methadone itself now is also stigmatised. So you also have the stigmatisation of the services, which mean that, that people now are probably more reluctant to go on methadone than they were because of the stigma associated with the drug. So I think there's a whole uh, range of issues and the problems. We, we do, uh, as part of our work, stigma training with this, the, the, both the specialist and the generic workforce. And I suppose that, you, know, you maybe wouldn't be surprised to know that actually a lot of the stigma from the wider society is also apparent within the workforce. So that's, that's something that we're working on really hard is actually to deal with those attitudes and stigma within the workforce. And I guess particularly around the notion that it's a lifestyle choice rather than that, as we've heard around the fact that these are people presenting you know, with, with serious problems and their drug use is a symptom of the underlying problems that they experience. So I think if we can get beyond, you know, using terms like addict, uh, abuser, misuser, and start talking about people with problems, then we, we start to, to uh, you know, deal with some of the stigma. And we've had discussions with the media around that as well. And, you know, the classic refrain from the media as well, you know, addict is shorthand. Uh, everybody knows what that means. Um, but actually, it just reinforces the fact that the person is, is defined by their drug use rather than, you know, by the wider aspects of their lives and, and who they are. One example, again, I'm quoting the history, but I remember in the 1980s, the old Scottish Health Education Council had an excellent poster, which I think I had in my office as a young social worker, which was six months after Alice had her nervous breakdown, her friends are still recovering, which I think was a really interesting way of looking at stigma. Do you, could you relate to that in, in your occupation? Uh, absolutely, and I th I th of course, uh, you know, there is that wider stigma on, on the family, and as we heard in, in earlier um, presentations, you know, that there's particular issues around stigma for the children growing up in, in, in those households as well in terms of how they deal with that and, and how they're dealt with, which, which also leads to, to potentially, uh, you know, adds to the possibility of them going on and developing you know, substance problems themselves. Um, so it, so it, it's a massive issue. I think the challenge is, is to see it holistically, um, you know, rather than, um, I, I suppose, if you like, simplistically. And as you say, the whole hierarchy of stigmas, because otherwise I think if we, if we look at you know, reducing the stigma on those in recovery from drug problems, we may inadvertently increase the stigma on those that, that uh, are still in the midst of a serious problem. Um, could I ask perhaps another question to you, conveners? Um, oh, to, I was, I was, oh, sorry. I was keen. I know there are other okay. witnesses who would like to respond to your opening general question and, and perhaps take those first and then come back to you. Andrew. Thank you, convener. Uh, it's, a re it's a really interesting question. Um, I suppose... I it's endemic. It, the stigma, it, it, it sits at all levels. So you, you often spend some time with, with people in recovery and they talk about being clean. Well, if somebody's clean, then somebody else is dirty. So stigma is right deep in, in, in thinking, even in the thinking of, of recovery. Um, 
about six months ago, we, we, we set up a, a live chat, which was on, just on our website. We didn't know what we were going to get. And within six months, I know it's UK-wide, but it's run from Glasgow, we, we've had 4,000 interventions. Now, these are people who are never going to put their head above the parapet. They're never, ever, ever going to see. They're never going to go to service. So if we are thinking about a strategy for the future, a refresh for 10 years, we have to think much more creatively about how people will engage with service, given stigma. So will they be much more anonymous, online, engaged, recovery communities? Um, so it is, it is, it, we, we need to think of solutions to stigma because we, we won't get rid of it. We, we can't say, it's so endemic. I'll tell you how endemic it is. I was listening to Ask Kay, or is it called Kay, is it? I don't know why I was listening to that. I must have been having a bad day. Um, and anyway, I was listening to Cole Kay, and, and um, a person came, I can't even remember what the topic was, but she allowed a woman caller to get away with saying, well, at least I'm not a junkie. And she allowed that to happen on the, on the phone. In, and I immediately tweeted her and sent a message to say, how come you didn't challenge that? Because if you think about people with drug misuse problems, which are, which are, which are not a group, because it, it's all of us. You know, there's coffee, it's all of us. But if you think about the perception of, of people with drug misuse problems, a homeless perception... You could think about a minority group and you could think, would we allow any other, mi any other minority group to be treated in the same way? Would we allow a minority group to be res sometimes refused basic primary health care because it belongs to a specialist organisation? Because, you know, that's somebody else's problem. We just wouldn't tolerate it for any other group. And, and that's how deep it is. It makes my blood boil. <laughs> You've both put it really, really well, but I would like to add that um, I'm really, really hopeful that we're not going to make the same mistake in our refresh of the road to recovery than has perhaps been made in England, in which I think a, such a clear focus on abstinent recovery, a limited view on recovery and tackling drug problems in that strategy has resulted perhaps in advertency inadvertently in a lack of focus on prevention and harm reduction, which in itself replicates that stigma. And you know, suggests that only those who are willing to, to quote, get clean are those that deserving of support. So I think we have to learn from the mistakes that have been made down south. I mean, I think from the session earlier, um, reference was made to the stigma um, that's attached to people with addictions, but those people with addictions are very often the same people who've been in custody, are the same people who experience homelessness. So that stigma is attached to them in a number of different guises um, and different... Um, uh, uh, results occur um, because of the services that they then need to link in with. Um, so if they're not seen um, in one service, you know, as an addict, they will be seen um, in another as either a prisoner or an ex-offender, um, and they'll be seen in another, you know, as a homeless individual. So th the stigma is attached to the one individual in a number of different guises and results in an impact in a number of different ways. Thank you very much. Um, I suppose, again, it's hard to add to what's been said already, but certainly with reference to older drug users, this is perhaps equally, if not more important, because it's the access to universal services that is so critical to help people with longer-lasting or, or emergent health problems, whether physical or, or mental. And I, I would have to say on the note of stigma, there's still considerable amounts of stigma around mental health problems, which are incredibly prevalent. And, and people use substances as well. David, did you have yeah, yeah, just to touch the final point, um, and I think some of the panelists have already covered this, is, is it clearly in that there's multiple layers of stigma, um, homelessness, drug use, um, and uh, drug injecting? Is, so is there a hierarchy of stigma? I don't know what other people think. There's probably less than there used to be. Uh, there used to be clear separations about how people viewed themselves with that term junkie being, being, being one of the worst. Um, I suspect there's more crossover now, but clearly if you've got multiple things all playing a part at the same time, then it becomes harder and harder. And I, I definitely agree with the internal attribution as well. Um, people believe they're bad for doing certain things, and it's not a moral choice. You're not intrinsically bad for... for if you like, the path that life has taken you down. And I think that's also something we need to address. Um, because from my point of view, with regard to mental health, guilt is a huge, huge issue and, and leads to relapse and all sorts of problems. Um, stigma can be substance specific. So we, we've mentioned words like junkie and there's a lot of conversation being around methadone and heroin. 
Uh, cocaine's not particularly stigmatic. It is when it becomes a problem, then it's got stigma. But in fact, you know, our, our media centres, our clubs, our bars, everywhere is you know, it's full of cocaine. It's the number one drug that we see online is cocaine use when it's in, becoming a problem. MDMA among young people, not particularly seen as stigma. New psychoactive substance, not particularly stigmatic. You know, it, it, it's normal behaviour in our universities. It's just, it's, it's seen as very norm. And drunkenness might be stigmatic. It might actually be less acceptable, particularly in a highly engaged social media era. Being drunk at 20 years of age in university, you really want to think about your Facebook, Instagram page. You really need to think. So people are, young people are very savvy as to what they use and how they use. So, so my point there is, is you can, you can change. Stigma is, is often tied to a drug rather than just to... to, to in the reverse, Andrew, that yeah. for high income groups using cocaine, that's actually a status symbol yes. rather than a stigma. Yes. And the new, the new, um, the new five panels are brilliant. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, th I think the, the complexity of the hierarchy is also people also have multiple stigmas. Um, so, for example, the, the, the drug injectors in Glasgow who also have HIV, um, they're actually also homeless. They also have mental health problems. So, I think it, it you know, it's actually f f you know, far more complex. The, the, I guess that most people they'll have their primary label is is as a as a problem drug user, whereas in fact you know they have multiple problems and actually can be stigmatised across a whole range of them. So so I think the yeah the task is uh, is is pretty big as we've observed certainly from the the training we've done with professionals as I said which um, their views tend to represent the, the the views of the wider public unfortunately. Helpful. Emma, I think you're perhaps indicating. Yes, I think one of the big changes since 2008 when the Road to Recovery came out is that the drugs market is far more responsive to stigma now and will exploit that because we have medications like Xanax which are presented to look like medicines. They're illegal in this country, they're not prescribed in this country, so people do not know what they're getting. But because they're packaged beautifully, they look like medicines people may think they're actually buying something that's medicinal. And as Kuladani expressed so beautifully earlier, people are very often using these because they're in pain. They make sense to people, but I would doubt whether people would necessarily see themselves in the same terms as people who are buying heroin. Fair point. Uh, uh, now, a slight change of tone and uh, territory, and I'll ask Alex Cole Hamilton to. Thank you, Gunvina, and good morning to the panel. Thank you for coming to see us today. I'd like to ask about the funding environment, particularly for um, recovery services out in the community. Because in 2015, the Scottish Government uh, budget uh, issued a, effectively a cut of 23% to alcohol and drug partnerships across the country. Now, some health boards weathered that better than others. Some uh, found money elsewhere to, to plug that gap and continue service provisions. Other did, others did not. In the city of Edinburgh alone, for example, that cut represented a £1.3 million reduction every year for those two years that we had that. Now, happily, at the end of last year, we had a £20 million announcement, which um, will plug a lot of that gap. But I want to know, is there a correlation uh, between that and the delivery on the ground? Is there a, a line of sight between that and the reason we are now the worst performing country in Europe in terms of drug deaths? And, and what, can you explore what that impact has been on the ground? Okay, um, I'll start. And, um, thank you. That was a really interesting question. Um, Ad Action is one of the largest providers of drug and alcohol services in the country. Um, about 85% of our money is in people. The rest is rent and overheads. But that's 85%. You cut 20%, you're cutting people. You cut people, you cut hours. You cut hours, you create waiting lists. Or you cut, you cut the quality. Um, the 20%, and, and yes... It, you know, it's been reintroduced, but I'd be looking at 100%. You know, if we're really going to take this seriously, we've, we've heard, we heard some um, barbed criticism around treatment earlier on, and, and in some ways it's fair and unfair in terms of some of the attitudinal stuff, but it's also unfair. If you're carrying a caseload of 60 people, what quality work are you really going to... What recovery work are you going to do? So, so you, you, lots of conversation around the mesh um, substitute prescribing. Um, if, you, if you've got 60 people, you've got a machine. That's what you've got. You've got a machine. You're not doing recovery work with people. You're, you're seeing people maybe for 15 minutes once a month. 
Now, I'm, I'm a smoker. I don't think I'm going to recover 15 minutes a month. I'm going to have to wait a long time to get, to get myself sorted. And we talked about whether people were parked or not parked. You know, Sandra, you, you were very eloquent in, in what you were saying, 23 years, and why has nobody asked a question? Well, if you've got 55 people on your caseload, you're not really going to ask the question. I, I, I sometimes give an example. I used to work in Earl's Court in London. I, I single-handedly ran a, a needle exchange, and there was 1,000 people registered on that needle exchange, and I was a single worker. I never asked anybody how they were. It was a pointless exercise for me. It was, it was glorified shopkeeping. Fast. It was self-service. Um, so you want to talk about the cuts, and you want to talk about money. Um, I think we need to really reinvest. I think we need to reinvest to save. I think we, we all know about our hospital crisis. We all know about bed blocking. This service user group, drug and alcohol service users, block beds when they, when they go into hospital. They go into hospital because they're not engaged in primary care. They're not involved in treatment. Um, and, and, and I said what that treatment is. So there is massive movement in the recovery movement, there's massive opportunities, but people can only get to those opportunities if they are helped to get to those opportunities. If they are stuck in a system, living in a flat, um, isolated in their community, stigmatised, how are they going to, how are they, we just, we just got to reinvest. We got to, re, we're on a, I'll, I'll repeat myself, we have to reinvest to save. Emma Crosser. I think Angie's absolutely right. If we don't pay now, we're going to pay so much more later. And I think the cuts to surface provision so far have actually reinforced that stigma. I can't imagine another public service being cut by 20% and there not being a public outcry about it. And I think the King's Fund has demonstrated quite well how discriminatory and disproportionate the cuts to drug services are, because I think there's an understanding among the public and there's perhaps a different way of viewing drug services among the public than there is about other public services. And I think Andrew made a really good point as well. We are losing good people from the field because of cuts. We are losing years and years of experience because of it. We cannot embed good prevention practice if the front line is at threat. And the front line will always take precedent over prevention investment. And I think we've seen that across schools. And I think what Fiona was talking about earlier, that broader concept of prevention, cannot happen without joined up working and without, without a significant reinvestment of time. Oh, sorry, just, what, what, what many ADPs did, and logically did, to manage that 20% cut is they put a lot of their services out to contract and used the contracting process as a way of cutting. So, you know, they're everywhere. I, mean, I, don't, I won't go into individual ADPs, but they, if they had a budget of £400,000 currently in service, they thought that service is coming up to contract. Let's put it out to contract because we can now get the new one for £300,000. you are just laying off people. I think um, David and then Adam to respond. Think, uh, on the front, I think there's, there's certainly good evidence uh, from England, and I guess it's the, the same in Scotland, of, of actually changing providers on such a rapid you know, rate of every three years and with the, f the, the focus on cost reduction. I mean, the point I was going to make around the, the, the funding was the one that Emma made really around the, f the, the it goes back to the issue of stigma and the fact that you know, th that would be seen as, as an acceptable thing to do to take that 15 million out. I think also that the, in a way the regrettable thing, um, but I, you know that's the way uh, you know policy works, is that the key argument around the reinvestment is around unplanned hospital admissions, which we've made and done work with uh, the information services division around the modelling of those costs, which is, is in our evidence. So I think that in itself, you know, we've we've got in the last year we had 800. And <coughs> 67 fatal overdose deaths, which, which has doubled in the last 10 years, um, and that is not, you know, uh, as great a concern as, as, it, as, it, as it should be, clearly, in terms of that. And I think the other bit of that, if we're looking at the wider prevention agenda, is that what we know, you know, in terms of the drivers, as we've talked about, underlying trauma, but also the links with poverty and inequality and, and deprivation, which are very, very clear in the Scottish context uh, compared to, to lots of other other countries um, in, in terms of that and you can see why we have you know probably the highest rate of drug problem per head of population in, in, in Europe and that is largely driven by that so clearly you know if that's driven by those factors it's also we need that investment in terms of a range of support services to help people out of their problems as well and that's the bit where you know we may come to later I guess in the questioning but but that's a key bit of actually where we need that extra investment. And the government's talking about a strategy around seeking uh, 
people and getting more people into, into services and then actually keeping them there for as long as they need to. But the key bit is, is and, and maybe come back to the issue around methadone in particular, but keeping people there uh, for as long as possible in terms of them, them needing the service and then dealing with all the wider issues around housing, employability, welfare support, etc. And those are the bits that we largely forget about in terms of, you know, not firstly keeping people alive long enough so they can recover, but also we need things for people to recover too. And that's the big issue that, that we're missing out on, and that's the, the substantial investment that we need. So we don't end up blaming methadone for, for the, the, you know, the, the failure of the strategy, which is clearly nonsensical. Methadone is one part of the overall solution, and I think the, the, the bit, and, and uh, I'll maybe just, just add to that just, just now in terms of the previous discussion around that, I think the risk around the notion of the part on methadone and actually, we don't have the data on that, so that's the first thing. We've got potentially 24,000 people on methadone. But our research around the 35 and overs was that, in fact, the big issue is actually people are not being on it long enough for it to make an impact. So there's a huge cost to the system with people actually being on methadone for too short a time. The other issue is around widening, widening that uh, offer around the range of support uh, medication as well. So, so I think the... You know, other, other countries that are far more successful than us in terms of the whole system actually have a higher rate of people in the services longer term. Um, but also, to pick up on Emma's point, their goal tends to be around quality of life and improving people's quality of life rather than a narrow assessment of success around whether people are still using or not. Um, I suppose to partly to make the point that, that these are wider societal issues and um, th things like substance use problems will impact across a, a l large number of domains in, 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 in the public domain in, in Scotland, irrespective of whether you're talking about health or social care or anything else. The, the other point about the alcohol and drug partnerships is that there's a, there's a big value in the fact that the money is, is if you like, dispersed by a multi-agency grouping. Um, that can include everybody from statutory to third sector providers to the voluntary sector to people who represent both the carers and families as well as the actual folk themselves who see our services. So that's really helpful. And, and the fact that it's ring-fenced in what might be called straight and financial times as well is actually deeply helpful as well because there's certainly probably higher visibility or, or more acceptable targets, if you like, for that money. And one of the things we're sort of wondering about coming along here was, again, from the point of view of, of um, certainly health and sh social care, treatment services are seen as core business and shoring them up is seen as core business and you sort of alluded to that in the question. Um, you do sort of wonder because some of the possible preventative work is, is clearly a lot more important down the line and, and also hard to impact, hard to evidence with regard to impact in the short term. And, and I suppose, I suppose, before coming here, I was wondering whether ring fencing of something like that might actually protect the value for the future, rather than just reacting, reacting, reacting to what the current situation is. And I suppose I would I would echo the the point as well that seek, keep, and treat um, balanced against a heat target of standard of three weeks referral to treatment may take resources. Thank you very much, um, Brian. I think you did a brief supplementary on this topic. If I, if I may, I'm going to use a, a, an illustration that I wanted to use actually in the other one is, is uh, this idea of, of um, <clears throat> in the preventive agenda of, of the through care. There's a, there's a, there's a group uh, catalyst in Ayrshire who work from prison through uh, to release and use art, uh, music and drama as, as their sort of hook. Um, and in visiting, the, in visiting them, um, uh, there was there was two things came out and, and, and to to your point David was um, number one there's there's a chap in there who is an incredible artist uh, and they 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 now have some place where they can now go and and be attached to something of importance um, so I asked him why did it take him to go to prison to find out you could you could be an artist uh, to which his answer of course is I never had access um, so the the two preventable health agendas there one if they have access early enough, and to preventing, the, the, there's a huge, um, uh, the, their figures show that a huge decline in readmission 
as well. So, I think my, my question is really around how do we how when we're, when we're discussing um, financing of the of the preventable health agenda, we need to look at education. Uh, at a young age, and we also need to look at that through service as well. And so, how how are those how are those being connected up, and how how well are we are we managing that process? Um, sorry, I think I know the service that, that you're talking about, and it and it is very good. Um, I know there was um, some mention made in the earlier session about people leaving custody and um, support not being available for them. Um, this is in relation to short-term um, sentence prisoners. So they're a group that, that we know and understand um, are often revolving door and can be quite chaotic individuals. But since 2015, after a couple of pilot, um, pilots been undertaken in Lomos and Greenock, we established through care support officers who are prison officers who work with individuals in the six weeks up to um, release those in short-term sentences um, and through the door um, for the first three months into community. And the first day, without a doubt, is spent attending appointments for housing, for uh, registering with GP and for um, signing up with addiction support services. Um, but we had uh, an independent evaluation done of that service last year and um, the benefits and the impact both in terms of supporting the connectivity between services, sustaining the individual, um, as was mentioned earlier, that initial period when, when they do step out over the door and some of the um, risks that they face in terms of passing by an off-licence or um, their known dealers, there is a support there for them and also to s help sustain that support. And one of the things that was mentioned earlier, which, which really resonates, I think, with us, um, certainly at the moment, is that issue about trust and trusting relationships. Um, and that's certainly something that we have experienced. And knowing now how difficult um, it can be for people stepping over the door, um, how, how much they have to go through in terms of sitting waiting in a housing um, office for two hours just to be seen, um, we've now started to use that to inform um, other work that we're doing. So um, in December, we've been working with a lot show and um, Solas um, from COSLA to uh, establish a set of um, housing standards for people who are coming into custody and being released from custody to try and ensure that where possible um, we can sustain tenancies, particularly for those on remand in short term, and try and alleviate some of the difficulties that people have been experiencing. I'll take a Kula Durrani approach to this and go oh, sort of global. Um, why are these people in the prison in the first place? It's a simple question. Why are we imprisoning this group of people? Um, and, and uh, you know, I, I have this... Cause I, one of my, my roles is I am I'm part of the PADS group, so I'm an advisor to Scottish Club, and it, and it is a conversation that happens quite a lot, which is, you'll hear this answer, it's a reserved matter. Well, it's policing and policy is not a reserved matter. It belongs in this building. And we can make a decision in this building as a group, as a country, we can make a decision about how we want to police and how we want to... Po po uh, make policy regards to how we treat people with drug and alcohol problems. We heard Kula Dorini speak very well, eloquently and, and others speak about pain and hurt uh, and mental health problems and social care and background and privilege and lack of chance. And what do we do? We put them in prison. Um, how dehumanise your own question, uh, David, around stigma? We put them in prison. So my view is, well, let's, let's the three or four times we heard the Portuguese model. What the Portuguese model even, it only goes halfway there because it talks about the decriminalisation of drugs. I, I would go further and talk about the decriminalisation of people. So it's not just their drug use, it's the acquisitive crime. Because very few people go to prison for possession of drugs. They go because of shoplifting, uh, soliciting, uh, minor fraud, fray, things that you really... You just think, you know, we just said it. Why do we put people in prison for under six months? Well, the prison service is we're absolutely up front. What are we supposed to do? You know, we stick a plaster on it and say, go back out. The policing, you know, I, I often feel for the policing because they're the number one. They're the front line of social care. And what are they doing? They're just, they're, they're thinking, oh, God, I've got to arrest this person. I don't want to arrest them. I've got to arrest them. And I, I'm just putting them back into a system. Hobby horse, I'll get off. David, 
just just to 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 follow on from the the, the issue around drug law reform and, and 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 Portugal, what is also interesting about Portugal, which is not I think you know widely understood actually, at the same time as as decriminalisation, they also increase significantly resources into drug treatment, employability programmes, welfare reform. So they did all of the wider things necessary, to, you know, to, to to make recovery possible, um, and that's the bit you can't you can't separate out the decriminalisation from the rest of it. But uh, but I, th I think the point is is well made around the fact that we're we're sending far too many people into into the prison system. I think the more you know specific point in terms of you know the, the alternatives, if you like, to, to to drug use and problematic drug use is the issue of access to to, to employability and employment and there we, we do really really badly in the Scottish context of that I mean we run a, a very small program to train former drug and alcohol users as addiction workers and we have about 20 people a year on that program but hugely successful in terms of the 80% the of those go into long-term employment but what we've identified is, is very clear that actually that you know those opportunities in terms of employment opportunities and training opportunities are very very limited, and actually that it, it needs to be across a whole range of of, of uh, you know training programs like horticulture, catering, you know building trade, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So we could do far more, and there's been examples in the past like the New Futures Fund, which actually put that employability into the frontline services. And we could certainly learn lessons from that in terms of revisiting that, because I think that's that's hugely important. The other thing, if, I, if just just to conclude, the, the work we've done around the older drug users, the 35 and over, um, specifically, we did a survey of 123 individuals, and what we identified with that group that 79% average age 41 were actually living alone. So the issue of isolation for people who are still using is hugely important. Now, to some extent, we've dealt with that with people in recovery because there are those recovery communities and groups, but they're primarily for people who have stopped using. So there's a big issue about some of the work around working with current drug users and, and fitting them into local community groups, art groups, etc., etc., to encourage them to have a, a view that actually there is a life beyond their drug problem and there is hope in terms of actually what they can achieve. And I think that's the bit that we're, we're certainly missing just now is that too many people, and classically one of the people we interviewed in that study, a 41-year-old in Glasgow, said that he hoped the study would be useful for others because it was too late for him. Um, and that's somebody aged 41. A brief supplementary from Sandra. <coughs> I wanted to touch on what you all said, basically, and it was really around the strategy, and you've given some ideas. Uh, when I spoke to the North West, when I went out there, they mentioned the fact that there were people there who were in training and they've submitted to the strategy their paper on what they think it should be. And I just wonder, it's a holistic report. Yeah, it's definitely employment, and we're talking about budgets. Surely we should be looking at all of the budgets of the Parliament and bringing it forward into not just health but employment, etc., for the specific group that we're talking about. And maybe we should re educate ourselves in the language, pick up on an Andrew's point there. But what, what I'm seeing is speaking to the drug users themselves, they were saying that basically they had what you might say no hope, no asp aspirational hope. And their aspirations was to, yes, to come off the, the drug, get better, and get a job and then be independent themselves. So I just wondered, I know we've got the strategy here and that's what we're talking about, but should we be looking at a whole different sphere of the strategy which goes into each budget from, from all of the, the, the committees and you know the, the strands of this parliament? Should we be looking at that rather than tinkering around the edges with the strategy as it is at the moment? Well, it, it, I, mean, I, th I think the, the, the challenge always around drug policy is to assume that that drug policy can fix everything, um, and it clearly can't because it's a wider social problem, and and it needs all of those things, as you say, and that would be the ideal. The problem it goes back to the first question around stigma, is that the reason, you know, employability programs don't target these pop, you know, people with drug problems is is you know is because they're not seen as as worthy. So you have that across a whole series of of policy agendas. So I think you you're right. We should be doing that for sure. But the question is then, how, how do we actually deliver that in practice? Because we've been struggling with actually trying to pull in resources from other areas for, you know, for example, that small programme. And we've struggled, we've funded it for the last 18 years. The problem is it's, it's expensive at £20,000 per person, 
but actually in terms of the outcomes and people then being in long-term employment and paying taxes, it, it makes perfect sense. But but you know how do you fund it? Those are the those are the problems. Right, so I, I'm sure we'll get the witnesses will have an opportunity to comment on that in responding to other questions. Um, Ash. Thank you, Kamina. Um, I just wanted to pick up on something that was raised in the earlier session, and I believe most of you, if not all of you, were here for that. So, obviously, you know, the, the strategy has been going for 10 years, and then it was characterised as maybe being an uneven service provision through that time and, and across Scotland as a whole. And, um, you know, there was an observation made that it's resilient to policy change. And I'm wondering if you would think that's a fair comment and if you have anything else to say about that. Who would like to? Theresa. I'm not, I'm not sure, um, probably, whether or not that I would comment on whether or not it was fair. I think the public sector landscape has changed so much in the last um, number of years since the policy was introduced. Um, you've got Police Scotland now, you've got the IGIBs in place. Um, so a number of changes, um, and certainly from our perspective, the transfer of NHS, of um, medical services to the NHS. So um, much of the work that is reflected in there is probably out, outdated. And then the patterns um, of drug use are changing. And we've heard a lot about that today as well. So I think I think that, that it would be fair to say that because of some of the, the changes in the way that the public sector works and um, how that's manifest itself and how that's developing, it, it is the right time to do a refresh in order to enable the services to be appropriately brigaded now within a refreshed strategy, uh, strategic approach. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure it's probably been said already. Unfortunately, I did miss the morning or the other session. Um, but, you know, there are a lot of positive things in the Road to Recovery document, and actually, I think they touched on probably one of the most important things for me at the time when I read it, which I still remember, um, is, is about hope and positivity and about recovery potential. And, and, and I think that if there is obviously going to be a new strategy, it's, it's almost the, the attitudes and values it displays are as important as anything. Um, although clearly that's being a bit over optimistic, but um, without that general feeling that people can recover, and, and I agree totally, a 41-year-old, um, if, if I was seeing that gentleman, terrible as it is, I would be challenging those beliefs because I would refuse to accept that, 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 that somebody ever loses the ability to recover. So there's some things about this which are sort of timeless, I think, um, and sometimes attitudinal things are, are those. Andrew, and then... Uh, Unfortunately, I was around 10 years ago um, and was possibly party to the road to recovery. I still think it's a fantastic document. I think it's, its aspiration is, is still alive today. I still think around the world, people still look at it and think the road to recovery has, it has aspiration. It has hope attached to it. Um, I work for a UK-wide organisation. I've just seen the English drug strategy. If I was marking it a 10, it means a lot to be desired. Um, it's still looking at a sort of outcome, payment by result um, idea, um, which is not helpful. Um, is, is, it, is it resistant? Yes, there are, there is, there are resistors. We, we're, we're 10 years on. I think in my evidence I talked to, and the Salsus report says that we're, we're, we need to think to the future. The, there is a cohort, and, and David speaks really, really eloquently, there is a cohort, and we see them every day when in service of, and I hate the word older because it's 35, so it's not older, it's people who are not even middle-aged. Um, um, there, there is a cohort who, who have been using drugs since, since the 1980s, 1990s, and there will be casualties, and we can't stop it. And there will be, you can see them in Edinburgh, you can see them in Glasgow, and, and we can work really hard. Um, and we were right to focus, and we're right to focus on on the the, the 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 that phraseology that we hear about seek, treat, keep, and what I would like to say seek, keep, proper, properly treat and recover. I'd like to see all the words in, um, but we do need to think about what's coming around the corner. And so I'm I'm and I know that Emma will follow up on me. So there are two things that we need to think about: is what are we going to do with our cocaine users, our MDMA users, who are not going to be like our opiate users, but they are going to have problems. And are our current treatment services fit for purpose? No, is the answer. What happens in Scotland if we repeat what's happening in America? 
What, what happens to us? Are we ready for another opiate epidemic? I hate the word epidemic, but are we ready? And would we use the same tools as we used the last time? Because we made a lot of mistakes. Um, so the refresh is absolutely timely, and it has to take a number of different elements to it. I'm going to finish just on one point in terms of road to recovery. A lot was said this morning about, about prevention, and this is the, the, the catch for this was prevention. At this moment in time, and, and possibly disgracefully, while we have seen drug use shift and diminish among young people, where it is a problem, there are very few services. It is a complete postcode lottery if you are going to get a service at all. And if you do get a service, it may be based in an adult service. So those 14, 15, 16-year-olds who could cost us a fortune in the future, not just financially, but in terms of their family, themselves and their communities, there's very little intervention, and that's the age group that we really want to get. Those people who are coming to the attention of A&E departments, our police and our school, pastoral care, truant and whatever, we have to put the money in. Okay, thank you very much. Emma, did you want to make a... Yeah, I think Angie's really wise to highlight cocaine, because obviously you'll have seen in the evidence that I presented that we had four cocaine deaths in 2000, and we had 123 in 2016. People can now buy drugs much, much more easily. Nobody needs to go to a dealer anymore if they have a debit card and they have access to a computer. So the road to recovery does highlight the need to investigate further what we need to do about deaths from stimulant drugs if the problem continues to increase. And I think we can see fairly conclusively that it has. I think as well, in terms of the new strategy having teeth, we need to recognise that this complexity we have with technology, with communication, and with movement of drugs around the world, we can also exploit that to try and reach out to people better and more effectively, and use that in how we make sure that we get help to people like the live chat at Adaction, the micro service that we operate. The last thing I'd like to say as well is that um, while Salsas does give, it a, give us a picture of declining drug use among young people, Public Health England have said that rates of heroin are decreasing while cocaine, MDMA, and cannabis rates are increasing. The Global Drug Survey says the same thing for Scotland. What we have to remember is to complete census, the school has to choose to do the survey in the first place, and this is the basis for our sort of drug policy and work. But those young people who cannot sit still for 45 minutes under exam conditions because they're suffering at home, they're experiencing trauma, those people are not being heard in census. So we need to reach out to those young people. We need to make sure they've got a voice in this refresh. It's so important that we do this. Thank you very much. Um, David, sorry, yes. Yeah. Just in, in terms of the question around being uh, resilient to change, I, th I think the, the, the road to recovery was very clear about moving towards a person-centred care. Now, I think the challenge, particularly with the big NHS addiction services, is how you do that when you've got three or 4,000 people in that service. And I think those are the bits we, we need in particular to, to, to look at, is how we deliver those services in a more person-centred care. The refrain we get from lots of the surveys we do with people with drug problems is that they have to fit the service rather than the service you know, responding specifically to their needs. And as part of that, we should include looking at extending the, the prescribing beyond methadone uh, to other choices such as buprenorphine. Other countries use slow-release morphine and also heroin-assisted treatment. So actually, you know, we're much clearer that actually in, in a lot of other countries they recognise that there are for a certain group who failed on other treatments that actually heroin assisted treatment you know is likely to be the only thing that will will, will keep them in the service. And I think I suppose in, in, in terms of the, the the last point picking up on An Andrew's point about casualties and we can't stop them, I, I, I would disagree with that in terms of the fatal overdose, is that the evidence from other countries if we have enough people held long term in treatment, actually their overdose rates have, have gone down you know, to, to, to very, very small numbers. And actually the deaths then become other factors like underlying health conditions and things like liver disease. So th there is strong evidence from other countries that, that actually if, if we keep more people in the services for long enough, we can actually make an impact. And I guess my going back to, 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 the, to, the, to the vulnerable young people stuff, I agree entirely actually that that's an area that we've actually taken our eye off the, the ball in terms of, because there continues to be a population of vulnerable young people whose life experience is very similar to, to the people with drug problems. So, you know, they are a group, as has been described, as a group in, in, in pain with, with a whole range of problems, you know, including 
yeah, mental health, childhood trauma, etc. So we need to actually focus on that group as well to ensure that we're not, um, you know, just storing up another generation of problems for the future. Thank you very much, David. I think you had a very brief supplement. Brief uh, comment due to Andrew's point about opiates in America. I was over there last year and was really struck by the explosion in opiate deaths. CNN were showing middle-class couples found dead at their 4 by 4s no other stigma issues, no deprivation, a bit like your cocaine users. Is there anything we can learn from America? Because that is very serious what's happening in America in terms of deaths. We have to understand, sorry, we, we have to understand America's... We have to understand um, America's relationship with its medicine is very odd. If you spend any time in America, just watch any... I watched an Ireland something game at 10 o'clock in the morning. There were 22 ads for drugs. Um, the transaction between the patient and the doctor is a financial transaction. I want gamepantan. I will get. I gamepantan. I will get it. Uh, that that's that's the the, the culture. Um, what we do need. What, what we do see in America. It, it's very interesting. It, it, it you just watch people's teeth in America because all they always have fantastic teeth, and then you meet people and you think they've got a drug problem. Um, it's it's mad. It's when you go into the middle of the country. And you find the huge areas of deprivation, the no hope, the sinking towns. That's, but it's also, but it's also. It, so one of the, sorry, I just want to jump back. One of the things that we need to understand also about America and about its medicine, and not just its paying medicine, it's insurance medicine. So, if if, if you go and you've got severe back pain, here we would probably be referred to physio. It's so much cheaper to give a drug. So that's why you see so much middle class stuff. It, it's so much cheaper in and out in six weeks rather than say that's going to take four months of treatment. So. Going, just add, going back to the question of stigma, it's very interesting in terms of a lot of the media coverage of the problems in America, they refer to victims. Mm -hmm. And you never hear that in the Scottish context. Mm -hmm. Thank you, convener. It's just a quick question, really. Um, the Road to Recovery document, um, does it need a radical rewrite as far as... Um, like, let's maybe target the media, the print media. Do they have a job of not using words junkie, alky, druggy? And also, um, as far as I'm aware, in the 15 years of taking a radical approach in Portugal, there's now a 50% reduction in heroin injectors. So that was from the TED talk that was given to us in our evidence from Johan Hari. So I'm interested about what would be the key asks for a radical change in our policy? I think exactly as Sandra was saying, we need um, a genuinely cross-cutting, broad approach, looking at every single area of policy. And I think Dave mentioned this in his evidence, the idea of having an impact assessment when we're developing the policy and then an impact assessment when we're reviewing the policy. What impact have we had on this vulnerable group? Because they don't have legal equalities protection, yes, but maybe, maybe we should think about that because they are clearly a highly disadvantaged group in our society who experience death at a differential rate. So we need to do something about that. And as you say, why not bring the media in on this? And why not give them some responsibility? Because I couldn't believe when I saw the, the Guardian had started using the term junkie again after years and years of knowing it couldn't get away with it. So we, we can't let all these other areas take their eye off the ball either. Um, Andrew? Yeah, there, there's not one person in this room who is not personally affected by drug and alcohol use. There's not one person here. Now, whether it's in your family, like I've, I've, I'm one of 10, OK? <laughs> There's quite a lot of problems. Um, just being brought up in one of ten is traumatic enough, but there are lots of problems. And so, it would, could have Randy mentioned it earlier on, it's not somebody else, it's not them, it's us. If you think about your own families and your own workplace and your own brothers and sisters and colleagues and, and friends and the people that you go to and the clubs that you go to and the places that you move, Everybody knows, oh, yeah, that's, that's Jean, yeah, she, well, she does like a drink. Oh, yeah, 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 he, his brother used to have a cocaine problem or a heroin problem or this problem. And that's how we hook the media in, because of all the groups of people, <sighs> yes, of all the groups of people with their, with their drinking um, and other drugs. Um, we have to stop the blame, I think, is what I'm saying, is that if it, it has to stop being them, it has to be us. has to be. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Ivan McKee. Thank you, convener, and thanks very much for coming along this morning. It's been a fascinating discussion and hope to get some more of your, your insights and in, um, the area I'd like to explore a bit more. Um, I'd like to touch on 
some of the data points, and I mentioned this in the earlier session, and there's a bit some contradiction there. Um, some things are up, some things are down, some things are flat, and just get your reflection on that. But then moving on from that um, to get your opinion on what should we be measuring, because I know there's been some, some of you have said um, people having a quality of life is maybe more important or as important than, than people coming off substances completely. So just understand what you think we should be measuring. And, and then maybe touch on this whole area around about funding and costs, because we've touched on that in a number of areas. We talk about at the beginning not enough funding into recovery and treatment. Then we talk about the justice system and should people be in there? And that's a frightening cost per individual to keep people locked up in the justice system compared to what you could do with that money and, um, and recovery and, and treatment. And then you touch on vulnerable young people, and that's obviously a big issue that Harry Burns rightly pushes. Uh, if you look at the whole life costs of, of an individual, um, and, and how many millions that adds up to. So maybe just to get your reflection on, on some of those points. If, I mean, in terms of the, the young people's data, I think the distinction is there that that's talking about, you know, whole population drug use among young people. So you have to, you know, recognise that actually a lot of the vulnerable young people actually won't appear in that data for a start because they might not be in school um, so actually what we don't we don't have good data on vulnerable young people but certainly we have a lot of anecdotal evidence from the training that we do around services for vulnerable young people that that issue is significant and, and certainly you know all those issues around risk behaviors um, among vulnerable young people are, are very evident in, in care homes, etc., in, in terms of the, the, the need to do far more than, than we're doing. And, th and that touches on all of those issues around, you know, going forward. I, I think in, 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 in terms of outcomes, in terms of drug treatment services, England's had um, the National Treatment Agency, and, and they have what you might say is much better data, although I think that the caveat there is actually I would question the accuracy of, 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 of some of that uh, data in terms of the level of um, drug-free um, successful exits from, from treatment, which are apparently 20,000 a year over the last 10 years, and that doesn't match with the prevalence figures. So I think we have to be quite careful in terms of how, you know, we, the, the data we collect, but also recognising that some of it can, you know, potentially be... Um, what shall I say, is, is, is not as accurate as, as, as we might hope it should be. Certainly that the, the government is developing a, an integrated drug and alcohol database system, which is due to, to come on stream, I think, from the 1st of April, which will aim to collect a whole range of data. Linked into that is, is a recovery outcome tool, which is actually looking at uh, trying to measure recovery across ho a whole series of domains. So I think that, you know, in, in terms of some of that work, and, and it's, it's been done you know, is useful. I, w I would argue, though, that actually what we need to be doing, particularly in terms of the, the, the services, is actually talking directly to the service users on a regular basis about the services they receive. Because certainly the, the work that we did, again, going back to the work around the older drug users, what you got from that was, you know, a much more nuanced view of that. And what was frightening within that study was the fact that people, and we were using peer researchers for that study, was that when we asked people about treatment, and they were receiving, they actually said a lot more when the tape recorder was switched off because they were fearful of the punitive response of the service. So I think that's the, something we haven't mentioned today, but is actually and links back to the issues around stigma and, and actually that the whole notion of, you know, uh, drug use being a lifestyle choice. So the, the, the people are being continually punished across a range of services for the problems that they have rather than actually being, you know, actually helped appropriately. So, so I think that's, that's an issue in terms of understanding actually the reality of how services are operating and not just looking at uh, the sort of headline figures of, of, of the data and digging beneath that. For example, we've recently done a, um, a needle exchange study in a part of Scotland which is, is, is quite illuminating in terms of some of the responses of the services in terms of how people are, are treated. Andrew. Yeah. It, Ivan, it's a, it's a brilliant question, actually, because a number of questions, because we struggle at the moment. I, I, I was quite scathing, I think, in my evidence, because at the moment, no, at the moment we, 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 we measure process. You know, did we hit a waiting time? How many people in the system? And, and while, I'm not, while I'm not, what, I, what I'm trying to say is recovery. What does recovery mean to an individual? So recovery is an individual journey. For some people, that means being drug and alcohol free or, or non-problematic using of drug and alcohol. 
And we don't have measurement for that. We're trying to get measurement, but taking David's point, recovery is also about quality. What's your quality of life because you were, because you were involved in a treatment system? Um, we are, if I broke my leg and I was going to a surgeon, I would want to know the chances. I, I've got a dodgy knee. I would want to know the chances of my knee being better. We're not very good at that in this business. Um, we're, we're, it was once described as, as inviting people to, around to your house to a party and closing the door, behind, locking the door behind them. It, there was a sense of there wasn't a future aspiration. I, I ask my services to have statements written on every wall in the service, which is 60% of people who come to Ad Action feel better and do better. It's there in front of people because we have to sell that there is a tomorrow and we have to sell hope. And we talked, Kula Rani has come around a few times. We have, we've spoken about visible recovery. You know, if, if we go back to Ash's point about is the road to recovery still applicable, it's the idea of the word recovery, the idea that all of these recovery movements happened, this organic thing happened and is happening every day. It, it, it's fascinating. And I, I think we can measure some of that. I think as a service provider, I, among my services, have had to create targets for ourselves because there is none in Scotland. I've had to say, if we deal with 100 people, how many, for, how many people are going to leave in a planned, coordinated, happy way? And the target that we've set is 40%. We've said, let's go for 40%. Now, I'd like it to be 70, but let's set a benchmark because I couldn't get a benchmark from anybody else. The English benchmark in, in treatment services, as far as I know, is 7.5%. That's, that's their expected put, throughput. I'm not, but like David, I want to reiterate, recovery has many guises. It doesn't have to be drug-free. It just has to be happier and healthier. I think I would say in terms of data, we have vulnerable adult groups as well who are very, very difficult to engage with and not... For, through their own fault, but because we haven't set things up in the right way to make them feel safe enough to do so. So, for example, we do have people who are homeless who use synthetic cannabinoid receptor agonists, or synthetic cannabis, as it's been called, even though it's not actually cannabis. And it's very difficult to get data, because if people are using SCRAs, their behaviour tends not to be conducive to actually getting through the door of a drug service in the first place. What I would say as well is, you know, it's a commendable effort that we've got DAISY coming in as an integrated drug database to track outcomes. But the vast majority of people who come to crew seeking help are age 35 plus, are using cocaine, are on the point of losing their jobs, their houses, their families. They are not going to give their information to the DAISY database. They want to be recorded anonymously as we record them currently on the Clinical Outcomes and Routine Evaluation database and on the Scottish Misuse of Drugs database. But that's not being offered to them. So we're going to lose all that data because we're not listening to what people who need help actually need. Thank you very much. Alison Johnson. Thank you, convener. Thank you all very much for your evidence. I think it's been really compelling. Um, I, I sort of, you know, we've spoken about the, the context in which people find themselves requiring your services. I mean, it's not about choice. And it must be, if we're talking about outcomes, and I think Ad Action, you were saying, please, <laughs> you, you know, please, government, ask us to, to produce outcomes. I mean, if the outcome of all our other policies are that people are requiring to use your services, it's not great, is it? Um, so I just wonder how frustrated you feel about that. And, you know, the road to recovery is going to have to deal with a heck of a broad range of, of other policies in order to prevent people from having to access your services. You know, Alex Cole Hamilton was pointing out that we're, we're the worst performing in Europe when it comes to, you know, drug deaths and problem drug use is higher here than in many other Western countries. So does that suggest that all our other policies are failing too? You know, why, why are we doing so badly? Um, I'm, I may have sounded, but I'm not that pessimistic. <laughs> uh, I, I may, yes, I'm not. I, I, I've lived in the West Coast of Scotland for a long time, but I've managed to keep some optimism going. <laughs> um, and, and my optimism is, is about the change in drug use. Is we have a very different dynamic, a very different... So I, I spoke a little bit earlier about young people and what young people think about drug use and how young people use drug use. Unfortunately, I have four children who are now young adults, and I, every now and again I catch their Facebook pages, which is interesting. And, and I can see some of them talk about the Monday morning fear. That's quite interesting. So what are they actually talking about? You know. I know what they're talking about. Um, 
but I'm not all that worried about that. I'm not, it doesn't concern me. What does concern me is the young people who have had trauma, the young people living in traumatic conditions, they concern me. So there's a, still a cohort that's going to be, that's going to need our help and the earlier we can get the help, the better. Um, Scotland, I don't have to say it in this room, is a great country and, and we have made huge strides. If you think, of, I came to Scotland in 1994, like anybody who, who who lives in and around Glasgow remembers what Castle Milk was like, and remembers what Easter House was like, and remembers what Drum Chapel was like. They are completely different places now, and when they were like that, they, you know, it was it was like twelve percent, thirteen percent of young people using drugs, problematically, to escape from their own environment. There's been a huge shift, a huge shift across the country in just in terms of the whole dynamic of the country, the whole confidence of the country. So I go back, the Road to Recovery is still a, a fantastic document. There are good things happening. We need to do more. Um, we need to not forget that we have a changing dynamic. We need to think smarter. We need to think about a digital world and a digital offer, given your point about anonymity. Um, but, but things aren't terrible. <laughs> I, I, I think one example of that is welfare reform, um, in particular that we're seeing with, with uh, you know high rates of sanctioning of, of, of individuals and the impact that has on, on, on people's lives. And I think that's the the point we've been making around you know the, the, the wider social policy that, that 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 can have a huge impact. And I think that's also the challenge for you know just like in terms of the discussion around methadone you know it, it's quite easy to blame methadone as, as the cause of the problem <laughs> you know but it's actually clearly not you know methadone is, is 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 one part of the solution and in fact you know all of those wider social issues come come to bear and, and they're as i said at the beginning you know they're the drivers of the problem in the first place and why scotland has you know the largest drug problem has the you know and the highest uh, death rate or, or fatal overdose death rate you know, so those those same drivers are also the things which should be the solutions, but that goes back to the question around the you know the, the issues around stigma and the fact that we're just not putting the appropriate level of resource because this population is not seen as as worthy or deserving, and it's it's you know it's seen as people um, engaged in a, a sort of self-inflicted uh, pastime. I think the other issue, and and particularly around the. Uh, uh, the 35 and overs in terms of that group is that they're doubly stigmatised because of their age as well in terms of that. And what we've seen, interestingly, with our um, employment programme is that actually, you know, we've had people who've never worked in 20 years get, getting work. So it's actually, it's the older group who are actually, you know, tending to be the ones that are recovering. So the key challenge is to, is to make sure we can keep folk alive um, and, and reduce the harm until such time as they feel capable of recovering. And, and that's the bit you know, we've talked about again is that is the the bit about needing those opportunities for people, and and and, and sadly, you know, there are a few routes to that, and, and and what we've had is the route into the care sector, um, and that's what most people talk about as potential employment opportunities. But there should be a range of others that we're facilitating as well, and investing appropriately in that. Okay, thank. You. Yes, last question from Alison. It was specifically to um, Theresa Medhurst, if I may, and it was just about. Who is responsible for prisoners' welfare on their release? You know, we heard from the er earlier panel about possible risks, you know, of liberation and just making sure that prisoners are properly supported before they leave. Just wondering, is there anyone in particular who's responsible for the released prisoner? Um, it, there are. Um, so, for for those that are serving sentences over four years who are released under statutory conditions, then um, criminal justice social work are responsible for their supervision back in community and, and the links into case management um, and how that individual's journey has progressed through um, their sentence is quite clearly mapped out. So there are fairly robust and rigorous processes um, around about that. Um, and that would include anybody that, that fell into the um, the remit of uh, MAPA arrangements as well. So, so for long termers, I think there are fairly clear, uh, well planned out um, supports in place for when people are released. For um, 
those on remand, um, and we haven't touched on remand um, individuals today, and those coming into custody on remand can experience the same difficulties as those who are experiencing um, short-term sentences. So the same issues with um, losing accommodation, um, with disruption um, from services and supports, um, lack of confidence, family breakdown, etc. Um, there, there is no no service or support and part of the difficulty with remand those on remand is that it's very difficult sometimes to know and understand when they're going to be attending court and therefore even um, setting up support um, around about a kind of court service might be fairly problematic as well um, because it's it's difficult to identify when people um, will be released from custody those on short-term sentences um, there are a number of um, schemes which are government funded through third sector providers for dealing in particular with young people under the age of 26 and for um, women um, and as I said earlier we have our through care support officers who operate in um, 11 of our prisons at the moment who provide support to those short term um, those people on short term sentences who um, agree that they want support on release. There is um, voluntary um, provision available um, in, in social work if people ask for that, but invariably um, those who come into custody don't seek out social work support on release. Thank you very much. And can I thank all of our witnesses this morning? That's been another excellent session, a very informative uh, and stimulating of, uh, I have no doubt, further discussion among committee members. Uh, we will now go into private session uh, in order to discuss the remainder of the agenda and we'll take a very brief uh, break while uh, witnesses leave.